one. On Thursday night, as usual, I called in at the Give and Take, a West London gay bar a short walk from home. Obvious shadows under my eyes, caused by lack of sleep, might have invited comment, so I put on a pair of sunglasses. They were the kind that magically darken in bright light. I had bought them that summer, and I wore them hoping, even if it was now the middle of October, that they would conceal my tiredness. Sunglasses go well with thick, dark hair like mine anyway. The give and take is not a late bar. I go there to chat with friends rather than to pick someone up. An activity the barman Miles calls looking for takeaway. His nickname is Smiles, because he can flash one that would cheer up a funeral. You okay, Ben? What's with the dark glasses, he asked, pouring me a lager. Been clubbing? Too much takeaway. Neither. Neighbors kept me awake. Should have known the dark glasses wouldn't fool anyone. The bastards. You hear some terrible stories about nuisance neighbors. Mind you, hiding your black eyes behind sunglasses is a bit transparent, he said, flashing that smile. Glasses, bit transparent, get it? You can laugh. Perhaps I should stay away from the bar lights, and hide in the dark corners. We don't have any dark corners, anyway, that's not your style, is it? Let me know if you're interested in moving. I know someone who's looking for a flatmate. Another customer arrived and Smiles went to serve him. Offering to put me in touch with someone who wanted a flatmate was typical of Smiles, who always knew someone or something that would solve everyone's problems. However, the earplugs I picked up during my lunch break promised to be a less drastic solution than moving home. Anyway I had shared a flat before, after university, a couple of years ago, when I first came up to London. The flat share was good in some ways, but eight months had been long enough. My current self-contained little place might be cramped and two floors up, in what my boss, Jeremy, described as a dreary Victorian terrace, but it was my release from taking turns with four others to use the bathroom and kitchen. Sharing had meant not needing to go out in search of company, but having more privacy, a few quiet hours to myself whenever I wanted, had been a big improvement. Until the previous weekend, that is, when new neighbors moved in upstairs. On Monday night the noise of heavy objects being shifted around continued until after midnight. The next night a series of rhythmic thuds hammered through the ceiling into the early hours with nothing that, from below, sounded like a tune. I guessed that they had unpacked and were celebrating their move, so I put the covers over my head and tried to sleep, but soon felt too hot. I pushed the bedding aside, put my head under the pillow, and dozed uncomfortably as the minutes dragged by. Wednesday night, with their noise again in my ears after midnight, the racket annoyed me so much that sleep was impossible. I went up to ask them to turn the music down, banging ever more loudly on their door until a young woman wearing garish lipstick, her eyelashes also plastered with makeup, answered. 1. Copyright Alan Kesslian. I'm from downstairs. Oh, you're one of the neighbors. Nice to meet you, like. Come on in for a drink. Despite my anger, meeting her for the first time and wanting to be civil, I went in. She introduced her partner, who welcomed me with an energetic handshake. Her name was Jade and his was Jake. Everyone, she said, called them the Jays. Stupidly I let him pour me a large beer. We chatted about the rents we were paying, and moaned about the three months deposit required by the landlord. They asked if I lived on my own or with a girlfriend, so I told them I was gay. With no hesitation they both said that was great, and she joked that instead of him worrying about me fancying her, she was the one who would have to worry about me fancying him. You have to admit I picked myself a looker, haven't I? Not sure of how to turn the conversation to the subject of noise, I smiled vaguely. There you are you see. Read your mind, she said, shrieking with laughter. Oh dear. Have to have a bit of fun, like, don't you? Beer in hand, my half-hearted attempts to complain had no effect on them. 
When I left an hour later, they had ignored what I said about their music keeping me awake. I was seething, angry mostly with myself for not being more assertive. Everyone has nights when their sleep is disturbed. Why should a bit of noise become such a problem for me? If you are tired enough you can probably sleep anywhere. It was not as though I was likely to fall asleep on my stool at Smiles Bar and fall off onto the floor. When Smiles had finished serving he came back over to me. Well? This guy I mentioned, looking for a flatmate. You might get on. He's a steady type, like you. The flat's really nice, you should see it. A steady type? Me. Why? Because I work in a bookshop. Jeremy would be most put out to hear his shop spoken of as a place for steady types. He would have you know that the two of us are the cutting edge of antiquarian book retail, not to say at the coal face. Ah, Jeremy, how is the old thing? Still wearing his Sherlock Holmes costume, he teased, referring to a very old-fashioned cape Jeremy sometimes wore. You and Jeremy, the fearless duo of historic parchments, you pair of daredevils. He knew perfectly well that we sold books, not historic parchments. Here's someone who must be a bit parched, I said, nodding towards another regular who had come up to the bar. I went home at 11 o'clock. All was quiet and by half past I had got into bed. After two nights short of sleep I dropped off straight away. An hour or so later the thud of the loudspeaker upstairs woke me. Should I go up to protest? What if they welcomed me as fervently as before? Easy to tell myself to be more forceful, but hampered by lack of sleep, would they shrug away my complaints as easily a second time? If so, and were I to be swept along by their matey banter again, things would be worse than ever. To try to forget the whole issue I put in the earplugs and slept fitfully until after 3 when the noise at last stopped. Getting ready for work at 7.30 the next morning, I saw in the bathroom mirror that the shadows under my eyes were developing into bags. The dark glasses were my only hope, given Jeremy's unconventional dress he was unlikely to take much notice of a pair of not all that dark really glasses. This was wishful thinking, for he commented on them straight away, attributing my tired eyes to too much reading. He himself had been working his way through the collected works of the historian Thomas Carlyle, and at times would lapse into a paternalistic manner of speech, those of us who love books must learn not to overindulge, he counseled, nodding his head. As I've learned through hard experience over the years, excessive reading puts a strain on the eyes. If we do not allow adequate time for sleep, how can the mind take in what is being presented to it, however fine the words? Now you mustn't think I am trying to lecture you, but be firm, Ben. No reading into the early hours tonight. He went out to collect some stock acquired through an online book auction, leaving me in charge. As the shop was empty I placed a chair by the door and sat dozing with a book open in my lap. When to? Copyright Alan Kesslian. You are really tired, catching a minute or two of sleep makes you feel much better, and the rest helped even though I woke up a couple of times in danger of falling over sideways. Jeremy returned about an hour later. The door latch clicked and the shop bell rang. He was carrying a box of magazines, and as he maneuvered himself through the entrance I stirred myself and quickly climbed onto the chair to tidy the valuable old atlases on a high shelf nearby. Why are you using a chair to do that, Ben? You should use the steps, much safer, and easier. It's because you're overtired. I wouldn't have been at all surprised to have come back and found you having a nap. Could he have guessed the real reason the chair was there? To divert him from any suspicious thoughts, I asked anything interesting from the auction. Oh, just some old him magazines. Or rather that is what I thought he said, wrongly guessing he meant the gay soft porn magazine from the 1970s. I asked to have a look. You won't find these of any interest, they're not what you imagine. Him magazines were a 1930s Church of England series dealing with church governance. The only potential buyers are specialized archivists. Sorry to disappoint you. Cup of tea instead. 
meticulous about keeping his stock records up to date, he had me help him make a note of the issue numbers and dates of the magazines while we drank our tea. We had almost finished when the shop bell rang. You go, Ben, I'll finish this off. I left Jeremy's little office and went to stand by the till, ready to make a sale. A man about my age or a bit older, tall and fair, tidily dressed in good casual clothes, walked towards me and said, Excuse me, are you Ben? Yes. Miles from the give and take suggested I drop in on you. I'm Dale. I've a flat not far from here. I'm hoping to find someone to share. Were you at the give and take? I don't remember. You're a friend of Smiles. I met him through an old boyfriend. Ah, I explained my problem with the new neighbors, but said I did not intend to be terrorized out of my flat. He shrugged. Do you have a lunch break? Why not have a quick look at my place anyway? I'm in full rose court, wouldn't take long, it's a really nice building and, who knows, one day you might think about a move. One of the words to which Jeremy's hearing is highly sensitive is lunch. He emerged from the back of the shop wearing a bright yellow jacket, the cloth stretched very tight over his tummy. Dale did not know what to say. Jeremy smiled. You've noticed my jacket? There used to be a jazz band that played in the gay pride rallies, the five members each had differently colored jackets, rainbow colors being the idea, I suppose. Some while ago I saw all five for sale in a charity shop and bought them. I assumed they once belonged to the jazz band, I don't really know. They must have made quite a splash at the rallies, Dale commented. Jeremy would be willing to lend you one, if you like, I offered. He's making fun of me. I'll be here if you want to go out for lunch. Bring me back a sandwich and a piece of cake. This made it impossible for me to give Dale the excuse that I could not leave the shop, and despite not having any real wish to see his flat I found myself on my way there with him. While we were waiting in the sandwich bar he said, I'm putting you out, aren't I? Your boss must have thought me rude, staring at him. That jacket. He thinks it's good for business, that putting on unusual clothes will make customers remember the three. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Shop. He has his quirks. Nice to get out for lunch, actually. How far away did you say your flat was? We walked for another 15 minutes before arriving at the stylish white facade of a block of flats about eight floors high. Two wings containing shops came forward on either side of the main entrance to make a little open square. The corners of the building were curved rather than right angled, and below the roof was a frieze with a motif of overlapping circles. There it is. What do you think? he asked. They're luxury flats, all right. A bit upmarket for me. Inside the ornate bronze panels decorated with chevrons and semicircles on the lift doors reinforced this impression. How old is it? 1930s. It's period architecture. He lived on the fourth floor. I'll show you round quickly while the kettle's boiling. It's plenty big enough for two. This is my bedroom. The other is the same size. The rooms were large and well lit, nicely furnished. Nothing was showy but everything matched. In the kitchen was a small table where we ate our sandwiches. Do you work locally? I'm a manager at the local hospital. The pay is, well, public sector rates, not fantastic. I've quite a big mortgage to pay for this place. My salary covers it, but I need a flatmate to help with the taxes and bills. I was sharing with someone, a boyfriend. We split up a few months ago. Have you tried advertising? My lack of interest disappointed him and he looked glum, or more accurately, glummer than ever, he had not smiled once since we met. The fault, though, might have been mine. Being pressed into seeing his flat made me awkward. There are always risks if you share with someone you don't know, he replied. He gave me the impression of being uneasy with strangers. If so, finding a new flatmate would be hard for him. We don't really know each other, do we? We could get to know one another, 
you wouldn't need to decide right away. Miles says you're steady. What is all this about me being steady? Alfred the Great, Ethel read the unready, and Ben the steady. This remark, meant to be humorous, made him smile for a moment, but then he must have thought he had annoyed me by calling me steady, and his brow sank back into a frown. Sorry, I didn't mean it to sound like you were no one special. Stupid of me. I'm sorry. No, don't. Honestly, I really do have to go back to feed Jeremy his sandwich. I go to Smiles Bar most Thursdays, and often a couple of other evenings during the week, usually from about nine. Can I see you in there sometime? Yes, that would be great. It's a while since I've been there for a drink. Neither of us suggested a specific date or time. The next time I walked into the give and take, Smiles was hurriedly keying something into his mobile phone. I had to wait for him to finish before he served me. You'd be surprised who came in earlier, he said. Some musicians from the Gay Symphony Orchestra. They booked the room upstairs to practice, about a dozen of them. I've been flirting with a very cute flautist. You've been flouncing with a flautist. Flirting with a flautist. Hope they come again. They bring a cultural ambience to the place. As a dealer in antiquarian books, you do too of course. About 15 minutes later Dale turned up. This more or less confirmed that Smiles had sent him a message to come to the bar. Though not unhappy to see him, Smiles might have asked me first. He made amends by giving us both drinks on the house. That's very good of you, Smiles, I said, raising my glass. Is this in honor of the Gay Symphony Orchestra's visit? I turned to Dale. He was flirting with a flautist. Well, maybe not flirting, Smiles explained, perhaps empathizing is more the word. 4. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Or fondling. Fondling a flautist. Ben. No, we had more a kind of resonance at a cultural level. He left Dale and me together. Trying not to sound suspicious, I asked, did you say you'd been here before? Not recently. When I first had the flat, my partner and I often went to bars and clubs, but as time went by we went out together less and less. We were drifting apart. I've more or less lost touch with the gay scene. This is relaxed compared with most of it. So many places are just about finding someone for sex. Okay, I thought, so you're a nice guy, not wildly promiscuous, but whatever the faults of gay pubs and clubs, life can be very lonely without them. Relationships have to start somewhere, I said. People need to meet. People want different things. I'm not trying be judgmental. You should talk to Jeremy. You wouldn't think it, the way he is now, but many many years ago he used to be in the gay liberation front. He hates everything about the scene, the anonymous sexual encounters, drugs, and so on and so on. It is hard to imagine your boss in GLF. Well he was. He tells me about it now and again, how important it is to respect ourselves and to act towards others in the same way, we must be true to ourselves and not be pressured into becoming stereotypes, being liberated does not mean being a libertine, you know, I said adopting Jeremy's lecturing tone, though this was unfair to him as he usually spoke moderately. His involvement in gay rights obviously meant a lot to him. These days he doesn't see much of other gay men. He's in his late fifties and would be out of place in the pubs and clubs where young guys go to find other young guys. Maybe even in here, where you get all ages, he wouldn't feel all that comfortable. Perhaps I should have emulated Smile's practice of putting people in touch, and arranged for Dale and Jeremy to meet. They could have discussed endlessly how commercial and uncaring gay venues were. But what if, instead of the moaning session being a release for them, they made each other more miserable than ever. Have you known him for long? He asked. Eighteen months or so. I came to London without much money, and had to find a job fast. I've always loved books, and Jeremy had a help wanted ad on a bookseller's website. 
When I first saw the shop you could hardly get through the door. Books were piled up everywhere. That didn't put you off. I always think a well-stocked bookshop is like a walk-in encyclopedia, a massive store of knowledge, far more than any one person could ever hold in his head. Jeremy's bookshelves were crammed, everything was jumbled up, paperback novels, old leather-bound volumes, newish hardbacks, fiction and non-fiction, books stacked everywhere, including on the floor. If he had found a way to do it he would have hung them from the ceiling too. You had to sort of slalom your way through gaps in the piles of clutter. He needed help. We had to offload hundreds of books to make room to move around properly, we even gave some away to charity shops. He found it hard to part with things, which is hardly compatible with the purpose of running a shop. Telling him they were bound for a good home made letting go of some of his precious finds easier for him. We organized what were left on the shelves, and went through and priced them all. He had a good grasp of how much they were worth. He broke his habit of indiscriminate buying, and sales picked up. He's a bit eccentric, but he's kindly and easygoing, which is what you want in a boss. I guessed you two were not lovers, Dale said smiling. Oh no. Jeremy is too high-minded for that sort of thing. What about you? Are you courting anyone at the moment? Courting? That's a word you don't hear much from gay men. Nor from straights nowadays, come to five. Copyright Alan Kesslian. That. You'll have to excuse me. It's the influence of all those Victorian novels in the shop. Lots of courting going on in them. I dare say, and wooing, and swooning. Maybe if gays didn't hop into bed with one another so easily, no, you'll think I'm prudish. I'm not claiming to be better than anyone else. Working in the health service makes me aware there's a downside. Not that I see the patients myself. Since he was unwilling to say much about his sex life, I tried asking about his job instead. What do you do, actually? He turned his head slightly aside and said defensively, it's management. Right now for instance, I'm sorting out the laundry. I don't mean separating the coloreds from the whites. At the hospital, for years and years the laundry has always been in the same room with rows of big commercial machines, not very up to date, churning away. Now and again one wore out and had to be replaced, but in general the laundry remained pretty much the same. Then we had an inspection. We were told the whole setup was obsolete, so we decided to go for a new up to date laundry on another part of the site. We thought we were doing well until halfway through the firm that won the contract for the building and installation work went bust. There were half a dozen subcontractors and suppliers. No one could agree who was liable for what. Now it's all going way over budget, and I spend half my bloody time trying to sort out the mess. Sorry, you must be wishing you hadn't asked. No, not at all. I didn't realize you had such a responsible job. I suppose I'll have to try and talk sensibly to you now, but jokingly I asked any chance of the laundry taking a few shirts and bits of stuff for me. He laughed. Thanks Ben. Thanks for saying it's a responsible job. It can be rewarding, like finding cheaper suppliers for some of the stuff we buy, so money is released that can be put to good use elsewhere. I've managed that more than a few times. When smiles began closing up we left together. Neither of us invited the other back home. Instead we exchanged phone numbers and parted at a street corner. He had been good company, but was clearly not the sort who slipped casually into bed with someone after a couple of drinks. Maybe he was a bit downhearted having lost his boyfriend, and the problems with the laundry were clearly worrying him, but doing something as worthwhile as helping run a hospital impressed me. This time he had not mentioned wanting to find a flatmate, but the subject cannot have been far from his mind. It made me wary of getting too involved with him. The earplugs helped me to sleep that night. The following night, Friday, was even better. My tormentors were out, and no noise intruded from upstairs. I left for work on Saturday refreshed. However in the evening, after I had eaten, 
Jade knocked on my door. She wore a close-fitting dress and her face was heavily made up, as though she was about to go out, but she asked anxiously, You've got to help me, Ben, like, it's an emergency. I don't know anyone else to ask. Jake's collapsed. I followed her upstairs. He's in there, she said, pointing to the door of the bathroom. He was lying in the bath, completely still, only his head out of the water, his eyes closed. What happened? I don't know. She hung back by the open door. He took some pills. We got them at a party the other night. Then he came in here for his bath. You don't think it's, like, an overdose, do you? I called his name loudly, but he did not stir. Surely he can't have drowned. I put my hand into the tepid water and pressed on his chest, hoping to feel a heartbeat or the slight rise and fall of his ribs, but could detect nothing. She stood watching. Not knowing much about first aid, but afraid something serious was wrong, I tugged at his arms and shouted in his ears, but he remained comatose. Did you try mouth to mouth? I asked. She ignored my question, but said, his head's above water. He can't have drowned. 6. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Maybe not, but if we tried mouth to mouth it might help. You do it? I don't know how to. He's your boyfriend. You must have seen it being done on TV. You hold the nose, then breath air from your lungs into his. You could try it. She stared at me for a few moments, then opened a cupboard, took out a shower cap, and carefully put it on to protect her hairdo. She knelt beside the bath and put her mouth over his lips. Hold his nose. She gazed at me pleadingly. I can't do it. Okay, I'll hold his nose, you try to breathe some air into him. Make sure his tongue is not in the way. The atmosphere was horribly clammy. She tried but the only noticeable result was a bright smudge of her lipstick on his mouth. We'll have to call an ambulance, I said. No you mustn't. They'll find the pills. They'll call the police in. No they won't. Anyway, is that worse than him dying? You try the mouth to mouth. I might not have been doing it right. I wiped the lipstick off his face, and as I did felt a sensation on my wet hand that must have been caused by breath from his nostrils. He is breathing, at least, but he might still need medical help. She took off the shower cap and put it back in the cupboard. A phone was lying on the window ledge and I picked it up. No you don't, she shouted, lunging at it and grabbing my fingers with both her hands. For a second her nails, decorated with silver flecked nail extensions, cut into my skin. The pressure eased, but she held onto the phone tightly enough to prevent me using it. I wrenched myself free, put the phone back on the ledge, and moved away, intending to go downstairs to make the call. She blocked the doorway to stop me. Don't go. We could call a taxi. We could take him to hospital in a taxi. It would be quicker. You can wait ages for an ambulance. We'd have to get him downstairs and put him in it. An ambulance crew would know what to do, they would take care of him properly. You don't understand. We can't afford to get into trouble. You're in trouble already. Please Ben, use the phone to call us a taxi. A splashing sound from the bath made us look round. Jake appeared to be trying, unsuccessfully, to turn on his side but he slipped back into the same position as before, only now his chin was under water, his lips barely clear of the surface. I went over, grabbed his arm, pulled him up a little more and shouted his name. His eyelids lifted a little, and under them I could see two slivers of moist eyeball. However, shaking him and calling his name did not bring him back to consciousness. I gave in and called a taxi. Together we hauled him from the bath and dried him. She brought some of his clothes in, and left me to dress him. She had not given me any shoes, and, searching for a pair, I found her in their sitting room, putting little plastic envelopes of white powder into a bag. 
where are his shoes? I asked. Oh, I'll get them, she said. She stood up and swigged a clear liquid from a glass. It's vodka. Want some? No. Come and help me, would you? We got him on his feet and stood on either side of him holding him up. He came round enough to make a few grunting noises, and she immediately wanted to cancel the taxi and lay him on the bed, saying he was getting better. Her attitude irritated me, and I shouted, I'll pay for the taxi, if that's what you're worried about. He may get better, he may get worse. We don't know. We maneuvered him down the stairs, Jade going in front to prevent him falling forwards, and me somehow hanging on to him from behind. The taxi driver said nothing and looked away as we struggled to haul him onto the back seat. At the hospital the young woman doctor asked what drugs he seven. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Had taken. Jade could not or would not say. Whatever it was, best if we pump out his stomach. Oh no, please don't, Jade pleaded. We don't have a choice. If what he's taken has knocked him out to this extent, it may damage his brain, or his liver, or his kidneys. The sooner we clear it out of his system the better his chances are. They wheeled him off and sent us to sit in the waiting area. She apologized for spoiling my evening, and said there was no need for me to wait. I left her sitting with the bag full of drugs on her lap. There would still have been enough time for an hour or more at the give and take before it closed, but Jake's overdose was enough excitement for one night. On my own at home I worried that not calling an ambulance straight away might have done serious harm. What if the faffing around had proved fatal? Would I be partly to blame? What had made me imagine mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation would have been any use? How much time had that performance wasted? Then I thought that Dale might know what we ought to have done. He might not be medically trained but working at the hospital he probably talked to people who dealt with crises like that all the time. I rang him. At first I could hear a couple of female voices in the background, he explained that he was with some friends from work. He must have moved somewhere quieter as I told him about Jake's overdose, because the background voices faded. He said, what we let ourselves in for by trying to help others. There's no way that you could be blamed for anything. Suppose you had called an ambulance straight away, would the girlfriend have been willing to let them in? Anyway, Saturday nights are a busy time in accident and emergency, and an ambulance might well have taken longer than your taxi did. What could anyone blame you for? Without a crystal ball, how could you know how it would all turn out? I didn't think of that. The taxi was quick. So you think we might have done the right thing? I'd choose you for my team any day. You sure you're okay? Yes, thanks Dale. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt your evening. Not long after that, Jade rang me to say Jake had come round and was going to be alright. He was being kept in hospital for observation, and she planned to return home and go back for him in the morning. I opened my door in case she might want to call in. I heard her go past my door and was about to close it and go to bed, but she came back down again and knocked almost straight away. I asked her in and gave her a mug of tea. First mug of tea I've had since I went down to my parents last Christmas. Do they live far away? Kent. Near Canterbury? I'm from Shoeburyness. Is that in Scotland? No, Essex. Not far from South End. Is the tea all right? I could get you something else. It's fine. After me ruining your evening, like, it's good of you to ask me in. You're straight, aren't you? Well, I'm gay actually. That's not the way I meant it. You've got a job. Straight is how you are, isn't it? Not dodgy, not iffy, straight. She seemed not to realize that she was implying that she and Jake were, in part at least, dodgy or iffy. He was discharged from hospital the next morning, and came down to see me in the late afternoon. He looked good, wearing a fresh white t-shirt and light blue jeans. 
His eyes were bright and he smelled of a sweet citrus aftershave or deodorant. His voice was soft, his eyes cast down. Coming to face me must it. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Have been embarrassing for him. You okay now? I asked. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for all you did for me last night, taking me to hospital and everything. Jade's good fun to be with, but not the best person at handling problems, if you know what I mean. Wasn't easy to know what to do. Are you alright? Do you have to go back for a checkup or anything? I'm fine now. Someone at a party we went to gave me some bad stuff. Usually I get it from people I know. Should have been more careful. Sorry to mess up your Saturday night. You must think I'm a right fucking prat. No, well, you weren't exactly at your best. I owe you. He hooked his left thumb into the front center of his belt loop, with his fingers spread out over his fly. Can I can make up for it somehow? He was not unattractive. I could easily have said something like you're hetero, aren't you, which would have opened the way for him to say bisexual or versatile if he wanted to, but sex with him as compensation for my trouble the previous night was a dubious notion. Would he lie limp on the bed, hiding his grimaces while I inflicted myself on him? Quite likely we would both end up glad when the performance was over. On the other hand if we had fun, where would that leave Jade? She might guess how we had got on, and be seized with jealousy. If he wanted to do something for me, he could do something that had nothing to do with sex. There is your music. After midnight, if you could turn it down. Have we had it on loud? Yes. You should have said something. Of course we'll turn it down. His voice had changed, become harder. Perhaps he was feeling rejected. For maybe a minute neither of us spoke. Then he added with emphasis, but remember, anything you want, ask me, no, tell me, whatever you want, it's yours. I owe you, remember. To lighten the mood I said, if you ever win the lottery. He smiled and nodded. Yeah, okay mate. I won't keep you. Shake hands with me, show you've no hard feelings. He grasped my hand tightly, put his free arm across my shoulders, pulled us together and hugged me closely. You're a real nice guy, Ben. Thanks. During that very full hug, I became sexually aroused, and I think he did too. It was only a hug, but the contact had not been completely innocent. 9. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 2. For a short while the Jays, to use the nickname Jade and Jake had adopted, did as he promised and quitted down. However, over a couple of weeks or so the volume crept back up. No chance meetings on the stairs provided an easy opportunity for me to mention the subject again. Friends were sympathetic, but had no practical suggestions. Smiles described them as those two noisy birds roosting upstairs, and suggested firing a shotgun loaded with blanks at them. Witty, but as I pointed out, wild birds are legally protected. Jeremy offered to put up a camp bed in the shop for me if my lack of sleep became desperate. Dale suggested complaining to the local council about noise nuisance. This might have worked, but there was an awful lot to it. A council official would come to visit, I would have to keep a diary of dates and times when the nuisance occurred, and ask other neighbors to do the same. Eventually the Jays could be served with a formal notice to stop. Ultimately they could even be taken to court. The whole process sounded as though it would take months, and did I really want to face them if threatening official notices were nailed to their door? They might retaliate by making my life even more miserable. Once, spotting them in the supermarket, I avoided them by pretending to study the labels of the herbs and spices for 10 minutes until they went to the checkout. Wimpish, maybe, but to cheerily say hello would give the impression nothing was wrong, whereas to berate them about noise in a shop full of people would be embarrassing. Worried I would be thought an idiot, I kept that particular evasive action to myself, not even telling Dale, who was always so supportive. We met in the give and take at least once a week, 
and began to spend Sunday afternoons together. His flat was only about a mile from a stretch of the Thames where lots of rowing clubs had boat houses. He belonged to the hospital sports and social club, which had a share in one of them, and he signed me in as guests so we could take out rowing skiffs. These little boats were so narrow they were unstable until you sat down. Fast currents and gusts of wind helped or hindered progress once you were underway, in the right circumstances they would reach exhilarating speeds, but could sometimes be difficult to control. Dale knew that stretch of river, and could find sheltered places where the current slowed and we could catch our breath. Once a police launch passed him when he was way in front, and came speeding towards me. In a strong variable wind, I tried to move out of its way towards the river bank, but facing backwards as rowers do, misjudged my position and looked round to see the launch within a few lengths of my boat. Too late, I worked the oars frantically in an effort to turn more quickly. When the launch was almost upon me, I drew them into the sides to make as narrow an obstacle as possible. The launch passed me safely, but its bow wave sent my little skiff rocking wildly. I could imagine what the police officers on board were thinking. Dale saw the incident, turned back, and seeing that I was all right, apart from my embarrassment, he said, hoping for a lift with a nice young policeman, were you? He was more reassuring when we talked of the incident later, saying they were probably more worried than you were. The Newspaper Headline 10 Copyright Alan Kesslian Police launch collides with rowing boat is the last thing they want. Few of the tourist boats came up to that stretch, some miles upstream from central London. Dale loved the river and knew lots of local history. Whilst walking the riverside paths he would tell me about how busy the waterway had been 50 years ago, with barges taking coal to power stations and gas works, grain to breweries, and merchandise to warehouses. There was a pub called the City Barge on the bank where the Lord Mayor's splendid ceremonial boat once used to be moored. Here and there were houseboats, some very smart with little gardens in containers on the roof, others neglected with peeling paint and rusting metal. One Sunday evening, after our trip on the river, Dale cooked dinner, a stir-fry, at Fool Rose Court. The Jays had disturbed my sleep badly during the preceding few nights. On Thursday and Friday they had had friends round and partied for hours. On Saturday, I stupidly stayed late in a club as a way of avoiding the noise at home, but that, of course, made me more tired than ever. Sitting at the table in the warmth of Dale's flat, full of his delicious food, I fell asleep while he was in the kitchen making coffee. He woke me by gently squeezing my shoulder. Haven't bored you that much, have I? I felt rotten. He had kept the conversation going all afternoon, and then cooked the meal. My small contribution had been bringing a bottle of wine. What must you think? I really enjoyed the meal, and the afternoon, and being with you. I'm worn out, that's the trouble. Why don't you have a quiet night here? The bed in the spare room is made up. At least you'll be fit for work in the morning. The prospect of a good sleep, with no need for earplugs, was difficult to turn down. I insisted he sit and relax while I cleared the table, loaded up the dishwasher, and cleaned his walk. We watched the news on television together for half an hour then, before we turned in, he showed me where he kept a spare toothbrush and invited me to use his electric shaver in the morning. That night was my first at Fool Rose Court. A couple of weekends later when he went to visit his parents in Northampton, he asked me to water his plants, gave me a key and said I was welcome to sleep in the spare room while he was away. He was not due to return until after work on Monday. I packed a small bag and stayed in his flat all weekend. After three good nights sleep between his sheets, I felt better than I had for weeks. I was about to say how grateful I was, but he jumped in first and thanked me for keeping an eye on the place for him. He had not mentioned the possibility of me becoming his flatmate since the day when, months ago, he had walked into the bookshop. Now the question hung, unspoken, between us. Ignoring it I said, I hope everything is as you left it. Except the sheets, of course. 
you might want to have them sterilized and fumigated. The hospital laundry could be the ideal place. Don't remind me. It's total chaos in there. The manager is due to come to see me tomorrow. If we can't organize a laundry, how can we be trusted with people's medical care? He paused and added softly, that's my worry. If you came to live here you could sort your sheets out for yourself. After all, we first met because Smile suggested you might be interested in sharing the flat with me. I don't want to push you though, and I won't mention the subject again unless you want to talk about it. Still, in about a month's time I will seriously need to find a flatmate. If you're still not interested I'll ask around at the give and take, or advertise maybe. What if you found you couldn't stand my personal habits? I've got some funny ways. We all have them. Try living here for a couple of weeks, no commitment. If it doesn't work out, you can go back to your old place. We could still be friends. I took up his offer of a trial flat share, and a few weeks later left my little place in the ugly Victorian terrace and moved in with him. My possessions did not call for a big removal wagon, so we borrowed Jeremy's van and made two trips. The Jays knew nothing of my escape until they saw me in the street with my arms full of towels and toiletries. They were on their way back from shopping, and had a mail 11. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Friend with them. I had glimpsed him once on the stairs but not spoken to him. He was enviably good looking, his short hair effortlessly neat and attractive, his brown eyes set back under a strong brow, his lips, the fact is, I fancied him so much it was difficult not to stare at him. The Jays said hello, and Jade asked if I was moving. No longer caring what they might think I responded yes. Found somewhere quieter. Oh, I hope it's a nice place. Not, like, because of us, is it? She laughed in her loud shrill way. The idea that they might have driven me out was evidently so absurd she thought it funny. Jake said, you didn't say anything. You going far? No. Well, I'll still be in West London. Don't be a stranger, come and see us. You haven't been around much lately. With emphasis he added, I don't forget things, you know. Actually, she said, funny coincidence, but Toby's, like, after a place, aren't you? Yes, on and off, he said. Those wonderful deep-set eyes now look directly into mine. Round here might suit me. He smiled. Even his teeth were perfect. He waited for an answer. I suppose I ought to have a final check round to make sure nothing's been left behind. You're welcome to come up and have a shufti. Dale, overhearing me, stepped out of the back of the van and said yes, go ahead, I'll wait here. Toby followed me upstairs and glanced rapidly round the flat, pausing only to open the bathroom cabinet. Empty. I asked. Yes. He smiled. Nothing to reveal your secrets. What makes you think I have any? Have you known the Jays for long? A while. I met her not long after she came up to London, before she picked up with Jake. Wonder if having them as neighbors would be a good thing or a bad thing. Depends on whether you're the party type. That what you are then. Only up to a point. He went into the main room and looked out of the window. The Jays must have told him I was gay, for he said, that your boyfriend down there, with the van. No. We'll be sharing a flat, that's all. Cozy. No. It's a big place. Plenty of room for two. Nice to have a big place if you can afford it. Won't keep you then. See you around, maybe. He went off upstairs to join the Jays. When I returned to the Van Dale asked, who was the hunk? A friend of the Jays, first time I've met him. Wonder what it must be like to be so good looking. He'd turn heads at the give and take, yours and mine included. We drove on to Fool Rose Court. The spare bedroom easily took most of my things, and Dale had also made space for my stuff in the bathroom and kitchen. 
Even in the lounge he had freed up some shelf and cupboard space, clearly wanting me to have the run of the flat. From that first day he was easygoing and adaptable. We agreed to take turns with chores like vacuuming and putting the rubbish out. During our first week together we apologized to each other a lot, for leaving dirty crockery stacked in the dishwasher because we did not think it full enough to turn it on, for being in the bathroom when the other might want to use it, or just for needing to pass one another in the hall. Sorry, one of us would say. No, I'm sorry, would be the reply, sometimes followed by well I'm sorry you're sorry, said with a wry smile. As well as saying sorry, we gave each other silly warnings, for instance coming through with knives, when carrying cutlery, or on the way to the wash basket don't look, transferring dirty undies. Whenever I came into the room he always smiled at me, and after a few twelve. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Days any lingering doubts about moving in with him had gone. Even watching television with him in the lounge was different. For him it was not an entirely passive indulgence. At intervals he would comment on the programs, for instance, when a wildlife documentary showed turtles in the Amazon that grew to a meter long and laid a hundred eggs, he flippantly protested that a meter long was too big for a turtle, and that a hundred eggs was far too many to lay. What can anyone do with a hundred eggs? Jeremy approved of him. Hearing that we would be sharing the flat but not a bed, he gave me some advice from his great store of wisdom. Sharing has so many advantages over being on your own. Life hasn't turned out like that for me, unfortunately, I'm probably too selfish. All the petty day-to-day -day wrangles, wanting to use the bathroom at the same time, trivial misunderstandings, knowing when to hold your ground and when to give in, I'm useless at all that. You and Dale are good friends, you're sensible people. Best of all you don't have to cope with all the complications of a sexual relationship. What did suffer during my first few weeks at Fool Rose Court was my love life. Though in the past my visits to the give and take usually ended with me leaving alone, opportunities to score with anyone dried up completely. Dale and I usually arrived and left together, and in between spent most of our time talking to each other, so there was little chance of encouraging anyone else to take an interest. Had he broken away from me to chat someone up, and then taken them back to the flat, it would have made it easier for me, but he never did. What if a stranger I took back stole from us, or caused other trouble? As two gay men sharing, sex with one another might look like an obvious possibility, but adjusting to each other as flatmates was demanding enough without, as Jeremy had rightly said, the complications of sex. What if one of us experienced only physical pleasure, whilst deep emotions were stirring in the other? The sensible course, surely, was for us to remain just friends. I discovered he had an aid to relieving his sexual appetite. One day, when he had gone into the kitchen for a drink, I passed his open bedroom door. On his computer screen a hunky man in swimming trunks stood on a beach with his back to the sea, rubbing his crotch. Returning, Dale saw me looking at it. It's a computer game, he said. An erotic computer game. You go into various scenes, a beach, a bar, all sorts of places, and these hunks appear who you can have encounters with. Is that your latest conquest on the screen? He could be. He won't let me down, steal my wallet or credit cards, or walk off with someone else in front of me. I decide everything he is going to do. You can try it out if you want. Were you going somewhere? Only the bathroom. He went back to his game and closed the door. Though I had never tried an erotic computer game, pornography of one kind or another had helped me relieve my sexual needs often enough, but did I feel the tiniest niggle that he went back quite so eagerly to his game, having said so little to me? He had probably been playing it before I moved into the flat, and was simply continuing a long-established habit. He had never mentioned it, and now that I had found out, my own lack of any love life felt more acute than ever. I thought my period of celibacy was about to end when the Jay's friend, the handsome Toby, appeared at the give and take one evening. Dale had had to work late, 
and said he would call in later. Toby was standing on his own at the bar. Hello, we've met before, haven't we? I said, trying not to frighten him off by being too keen. Ben, isn't it? Let me buy you a drink. You did me a favor showing me your old flat. I've moved in. Really? Do you share the Jay's taste in music? I know what you mean. No, but I do go up and get a drink out of them if I hear them bouncing 13. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Around upstairs. This is not a bad place. You come here much. Conversation was progressing nicely until, a few minutes later, Dale came in. Wow, he said to Toby. Haven't seen you in here before. I'm Dale, by the way. Hi Dale. Toby. Toby, wow, that's a great name. Were you called that for any special reason, or just because it's a terrific name? Dale, I thought, would never get anywhere with a tired old chat up line like that, but to my surprise Toby switched his attention from me to him, and they were soon smiling and chatting away as if they were the only two in the bar. For Dale to move in on me like that was not like him at all. I gave him a furious look. Hiding my face from Toby by raising my hand, I silently mouthed the words go away. He took no notice, and completed my humiliation by leaving the bar with Toby. See you Ben, they called out as they left. So much for me worrying about bringing a stranger to the flat who might cause trouble. Smiles, watchful as ever, came over. Did I really see what I thought I saw? Dale leaving the bar with takeaway. Terrific looking guy, too. He moved in on me and ruined my chances. That's what friends are for, Ben, to get in your way and spoil your fun. Still, first time I've seen Dale with anyone since he split up with his boyfriend. What if I go back and the two of them are at it on the sofa? They won't be. Anyway you always do alright. Some of the guys from the Gay Symphony Orchestra should be in later. Stick around and you might find yourself cuddling a clarinetist. Resentment at Dale walking out with Toby had put me in the wrong mood for chatting up anyone else. After briefly saying hello to a couple of friends, I left the bar. When I quietly let myself into the flat, Dale's bedroom door was closed. He and Toby were presumably together in his bed. Reasoning that Dale's computer game had been his only sexual release for a long time, and that therefore it would do him good to hold a real live person in his arms, I managed to cool my temper. Yet, for the first time, he had really annoyed me. Later I heard the front door open and shut, and guessed Toby had left. The next couple of days I spoke to Dale only when necessary. Several times he asked you okay, Ben, and nothing wrong, is there Ben? Each time I shrugged and turned away. A text message from him arrived while I was at work saying I fucked everything up, haven't I? Sorry. My fault. Still angry, my first impulse was to delete it straight away, but Jeremy had heard the phone ring, could tell I was annoyed and said, something's happened. After a bit of coaxing I told him about Dale walking off with Toby. That really doesn't sound the least bit like Dale. At times we all act as if we to have a monster lurking inside us. Mostly we have it under control, but every now and again, you've every right to be annoyed, but don't do anything in anger. Until now he has been a good friend, hasn't he? So far. Don't. Listen, take it easy. You're wound up now. He said he's sorry. I mulled over what to do about Dale's message, and sent the terse reply saw him first, take away snatcher. He replied with want to be friends, am very sorry. Oh you. Two days later I was up on the steps, bringing down the four hefty volumes of the Imperial English Dictionary for a customer, when Toby walked into the shop. He made straight for me. Hello, he said cheerily from the foot of the steps, clearly unaware I was still smarting over being abandoned by him the other night. How tempted I was to drop the weighty books on his head as repayment. Be with you as soon as I can, I said, pretending not to know who he was. 
he went to the other end of the shop and began reading the spines of the encyclopedias. After descending to his level, and spending more time than necessary with the customer, I went over to him and asked Techily, can I help at all? Oh, it's you. 14. Copyright Alan Kesslian. I saw you through the window and thought I'd say hello. He could not possibly have seen me through the window, rows of bookshelves being in the way, but those beautiful brown eyes focused on me, neutralizing my anger, making me wonder what it must be like to see such a handsome face gazing back at you in the mornings from the shaving mirror. What did you think of the give and take? I asked abruptly. Though you weren't there for long. You walked out with my flatmate, remember? The comment did not throw him at all. Well, you introduced us. Did I? You and I were talking, he came over, I blinked a couple of times and the next thing you two were going through the door together. He's a fast worker. We were having a chat, you and me, but you didn't seem all that interested. When your flatmate arrived you did something weird. You sort of screwed up your face. You tried to hide it with your hand, but I could see. It's okay, your flatmate explained all about it. Explained what exactly? I asked, suspecting that Dale had told him I was cursed with an uncontrollable facial twitch. That you're a bit nervous with strangers and need time to relax. I know how you feel, I used to be the same. Anyway, this is the third time we've met. You shouldn't be so nervy now. I'm perfectly okay. Good. How about meeting me one evening? I should have told him to piss off, but his looks had charmed away my resentment. That would be nice, was what I actually said. We met at a pub he knew, and ate at a self-service Chinese restaurant. He said he worked as a personal fitness trainer, and had some clients at a very exclusive club, but would not say more. Can't talk about clients, he said, making a gesture with an open palm suggestive of pushing away my tentative queries. Somehow he made even this negative signal appear attractive. We finished eating and he took me back to my old flat, now his. The Jay's sound system was clearly audible. He had me lie on the bed fully clothed and lay on top of me, then after a few minutes of caressing and fondling said, let's get undressed now. He knew what he wanted sexually, and I was happy to do whatever pleased him. Afterwards, as I was getting ready to leave he asked for my phone number. This might not have meant anything, some men who have lots of casual pickups swap numbers after sex because it makes for an easy exit, but my spirits soared. 15. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 3. Should I have said something to Dale about my date with Toby? He might think I was taking revenge on him for coolly charming my prize away at the give and take. Better surely to say nothing, Toby might have decided one night with me was enough. Although my constant hope was to find a boyfriend, for months and months my love life had not progressed further than casual one-nighters. I left to see you again, message on Toby's phone the next day. For more than a week no reply came, clearly he was not yearning for my company. Then at last he rang, and asked me to go to a club in South London with him that same evening. I said yes, trying to sound moderately pleased, while hiding the euphoria that hearing his voice again had engendered. The club was a short walk from Brixton Underground Station. Mixed straight and gay, it had everything to make a great night out, good dance music, terrific lights, and an attractive crowd full of life. Not knowing who you might run into in a new club is part of the excitement. Toby had lots of friends there. He used his phone every few minutes to send or receive messages. At first I thought he was contacting people outside, but seeing so many inside the club use their phones, then gesture to friends across the room, I realized that most of these messages were to other clubbers. They were the most practical way of communicating, since making yourself heard over the loud music was near impossible. As often as not, when he received a message, he went off to see someone on the crowded dance floor, and would come back to me after 10 minutes or so. Once he disappeared for about 20 minutes, and I sent him the text message gone om you. 
He came back and opened his hand to show me some pills. Want one? What are they? Specials. Like ecstasy. New love drug. The incident of Jake lying unconscious in the bath did not encourage me to try suspect pills. Anyway, being with a man as stunning as Toby was enough of a love drug for me, no chemical assistance was required. I don't need it. Suit yourself, he said, and put one in his own mouth. What made him so sure, I wondered, that what he was taking was a new love drug, and not something meant for worming cats? His willingness to take a god knows what might be in it pill surprised me. Soon the noise and flashing lights became overpowering. The club had filled up, and the bigger crowd made the atmosphere frenetic. Up at the bar I had to shout my order several times to be heard. Beer frothed over the top of the plastic glass onto a bar surface already awash with liquid. A lad so young he was probably still at school jostled his way past me in a dash for the toilets, slopping everyone's drinks as he hurried by. He threw up, slipped over and crashed to the floor, his legs splayed out in his vomit. An older guy helped him up and pushed him towards the exit, his adventures over for 16. Copyright Alan Kesslian. The night. No one tried to clear up the mess. Thinking this might be a good time to leave, I shouted to Toby, things are getting a bit frantic. He pulled me into the middle of the dancers, where somehow we found enough space to move our limbs a little in time with the music. Happiness at being with him returned. Everyone could see we were together, that I was with the most stunning guy in the place. During a brief lull in the sound he said, there's someone I need to talk to. Shouldn't take long. After that we'll go. He passed the patch of vomit, now marked by a sign saying danger wet floor, and disappeared through the doorway leading to the toilets. Beyond them, past a couple of seats, was an outdoor area for people to smoke or cool off after the heat of the club. What was he doing out there? Dealing in drugs. When he came back he said, had enough of this. Yes. Outside he asked, what did you think of the club? Great. Exciting, a bit hectic. You need to unwind more, Ben. Take an ecstasy or have a few loggers before you go in. Oh, well. I'm not dragging you away. I've seen the people I came to see. So what now? My place or yours? Suppose I could say your old place or your new place. At Fool Rose Court we might, of course, encounter Dale, so we went to the flat that had once been mine and was now his. The Jays must have gone out, for the house was quiet. In the main room Toby said let me undress you, as though I was the one whose looks made an inch by inch exposure of flesh thrilling. He said, wide shoulders, slim hips, yes, you'll do for me. He made me feel more attractive and desirable than anyone ever had before, but how much of his desire was due to me, rather than the love drug he had taken? That's it, keep still, he said as he struggled with the button on the waistband of my jeans. Though I held my tummy muscles taut, he continued to fumble. I wanted to help but he pushed my hand away and lightly smacked my thigh. No, keep still now. Let me. I suppose he wanted to be in control, but as it took him about two minutes to undo that one button it was a strange bit of foreplay. Still, anything that pleased him was enjoyable for me too. Any doubts about what he had been up to in the club vanished in the glow of making love. After sex he said, now be a good boy and go and make me some coffee. I had to hunt for the mugs and coffee jar, as they were not where I used to keep them. Going out with him always meant spending more money than usual. He would call a cab, even when a bus would have been almost as quick. His favorite club charged admission, and their drinks were expensive compared with the give and take. It was not somewhere you could go wearing any old clothes. Hard up after a particularly extravagant night out, I asked Dale if he would mind waiting a week for a contribution to the kitty for cleaning materials and household items. Only a few pounds. As we had a good stock of essentials this was no big problem, but it meant him knowing I was out of money. He offered me a loan, 
but on my modest pay, borrowing would only put off the hardship until later. Economies were the only answer. If necessary I might even have to turn down a night out with Toby. By this time I had told Dale that Toby was my boyfriend. He did not appear surprised or concerned, but inevitably our friendship suffered. Visits to the give and take together became less frequent, and our once regular Sunday afternoon outings became rare. We were still good friends, but inevitably time spent with Toby was time not spent with Dale. To save money I avoided the high street shops, where an impulse buy might be tempting, and went more often into charity shops. Most of the men's clothing they had was not worth bothering with, but 17. Copyright Alan Kesslian. The brick a brack and second hand books made interesting browsing. The volunteers were usually happy to have a few minutes chat, even without me buying anything. 1. That raised funds for cats and dogs. Homes, had flimsy shelves that had bent under the weight of second hand books, mostly crime stories and other cheap fiction. On the floor underneath the bottom shelf were some cardboard boxes, full of odd items shoved down there out of the way. From the bottom of one of these I extracted a huge old hardback. It turned out to be a complete works of William Shakespeare, printed in an antiquated style, the letter S confusingly like the modern F. The lady behind the counter who served me checked inside the front and back cover but no price was marked, and she let me have it for five pounds. You don't happen to know where it came from? I asked. Not the vaguest idea. People bring in all kinds of old cast-offs. A lot of them go directly to the bins. A book like that will always be useful, though. An aunt of mine used one that size for pressing flowers. In Jeremy's bookshop we had sold a couple of old volumes of Shakespeare to collectors for hundreds of pounds. Of course my find might not be worth much, but on the way home I began to feel guilty about the idea of making a profit at the expense of a charity shop. If it should turn out to be worth a fortune, a donation to the cause would ease my conscience. Back at Fool Rose Court I examined the illustration on the title page again. It was a head and shoulders engraving of Shakespeare, the alert eyes glancing to one side. Above the picture were the words Mr. Will I am Shakespeare's, sick, comedies, histories, and tragedies, published according to the true original copies. Below was written London. Printed by Isaac Iagard, and Ed. Blount. 1623. It could not, surely, be a genuine first folio edition? Copies were worth hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. My spine tingled. The book was old, but surely not that old. A hundred or more years maybe, not nearly four hundred. The cover, a thick, dark green woven fabric, had an elaborate embossed design, which was very even and regular. It had surely been machined rather than hand-tooled. Imagine, if a genuine 1623 folio edition of Shakespeare really had somehow been left in the bottom of a charity shop box. If only that were possible. My purchase might go for auction at Christie's or Sotheby's. Was it conceivable, even, that the pages of a 17th century book might have been rebound in a Victorian cover? If only. Thinking that was as pointless as dreaming of being as handsome as Toby or as sensible as Dale. In the bookshop, Jeremy's professional eye quickly assessed my discovery. He wasted no time in bringing my pipe dreams to an end. After all of 20 seconds he said, it's in excellent condition. A Victorian copy, of course. You realized that, I hope. You didn't pay a lot for it? Five pounds, I said flatly, suddenly fearing the charity shop might have done well to get that much for it. Oh, well done. It's not bad. A charity shop, eh? Always worth keeping your eyes open. If you want to sell I'll get you at least 50 for it, easily, at the next book fair. You're developing the knack for this business, aren't you Ben? He was good-hearted, and using his knowledge of the trade would get me a fair price, keeping nothing for himself. By the way, he said, the booksellers guild's annual dinner is in a few weeks. 
time. Be nice if you came along. Help to give you a broader picture. As well as rare book dealers, quite a few of the independent booksellers will be there. Air, nice of you to ask, but I don't have clothes for a formal dinner, I said, thinking that the event sounded boring. The booksellers guild dinner is not an occasion for formal attire. Smart casual, newish jeans. We'll be fine. You really should come. The after dinner speaker will be the veteran novelist Lloyd Larcher. I know him slightly. Do you know many famous people, Jeremy? I asked. No. I met him at a chiropody clinic. A chiropody clinic? You've never said anything about having trouble with your feet. I dropped a heavy box of books and broke a toenail. At least it got larger and me off on a 18. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Good footing, he said laughing. I could have followed up with a comment about corny jokes, but it might have sidetracked us into hitting the nail on the head or needing to keep in step. Instead I asked, we don't have anything of his in the shop, do we? He hasn't published anything for years. I think we sold the only book of his we had. Not a Rennie more, not a Rennie less, I think it was. Strange title. Yes. It was about industrial espionage in the pharmaceutical industry. One of the big suppliers made a fuss, threatened a lawsuit over the use of their trade name. If you really want to read something of his, I might have his saga of North Sea fishing at home, not a Blenny more, not a Blenny less, though it wasn't his best book, in my view. Blenny? A little fish that's not much sought after. Exactly. A few days later he proudly showed me the invitation card to the guild's dinner. Below the details, printed in scrolled decorative letters, the words Jeremy Stimplebaum and Guest had been added in light blue ink in beautiful copper plate handwriting. On the day of the event I put on a clean shirt and my newest jeans, he wore a black polo neck with a gold pendant, and amazingly baggy trousers with acres of dark twill cloth between waist and knee. I could not decide if this garment had come from an expensive boutique for more mature men, or if it had been handed down by a very elderly relative. Fortunately, among fellow members of the guild, we did not appear particularly odd. Some of the women wore necklaces with beads the size of golf balls, while others sported highly ornate spectacles that covered half their faces. The suits that some of the men wore were like heirlooms left over from the days of the Boer War. They had probably been stored in mothballs for generations. Several 50-plus men had long hair tied back in thin graying ponytails. Larcher himself, like other dignitaries at the top table, wore a dinner jacket. I guessed he was in his 70s, his hair white above a very pink face. The guild's members and their guests sat at four long tables running the length of the hall. Several same-sex couples arrived, making me worry that people would think I was Jeremy's bit of stuff. As the meal progressed, large quantities of wine were consumed. The booksellers talked more and more freely, and the noise level rose steadily. The guild's chairman tapped his glass and knocked loudly on the table to call for quiet. To thin applause Larcher rose to speak. He embarked on a merciless tirade against modern novelists. Among his accusations were that thin material was padded out to 500 or more pages, as though a book's worth could be measured by the kilogram, that modern novelists had nothing to say worth the effort of reading, and that their books were mere ornaments, purchased to match the color of the lounge curtains. Modern fiction was, he claimed, bought as a shelf filler to impress guests, destined never be taken down and read, the output of a small and shrinking band of self-proclaimed literati, or of hacks who conspired with greedy publishers to peddle tripe to people with third-class brains. Wow. Is he always like this? I asked Jeremy, after Larcher had finished speaking. He knows his audience. A sharp-faced woman opposite overheard us, gulped down half a glass of red, and leaning forward said, tripping over her words, he's too soft on them. If you want my opinion of modern authors, they should be g-guttle gulleted like fish. I know what you mean, Jeremy said. He turned quickly to me. Great thing about Lloyd these days is, 
since he's no longer writing, he can say what he likes. He grabbed my arm, accidentally bonking me on the head with his gold pendant as he stood up. Come on, if I know him he'll be off now he's earned his fee. He pulled me to my feet and hurried me towards the side entrance. We were just in time catch Lloyd on his way out. 19. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Jeremy. How long has it been? Who's this you've got in tow, you old rascal? Let me introduce Ben, who works at the bookshop. He loves books. He's my right-hand man. He kindly came along to keep me company, on condition that I did my utmost to bring him before you. This was not true, in fact, had Jeremy not pressed me to go I would not have been there at all. A smiling larger grasped my hand warmly. Is that so? Right hand man, no less. Lucky to have help like him Jeremy, in that wonderful cultural emporium of yours. How is business these days? It's much better since Ben joined my little enterprise. Matter of fact, I could use a bit of help with some work that is in the offing. Just a few hours administrative, clerical type of stuff for a week or two, nothing more exciting I'm afraid, but the fee could be a couple of hundred, and the work can be fitted in to suit you. If Jeremy has no objection, Ben, dear chap, are you interested? Good. I'll be in touch. He gave me his card and strode out through the side door. I was so delighted at the prospect of assisting the famous larcher that I could have given Jeremy a kiss, except that it would confirm any suspicions the diners had about us. Telling Toby about the dinner, or meeting Lloyd Larcher, would have been pointless. He was only ever interested in things relevant to his immediate needs. Even the give and take, with its mixed age group, he referred to as that old dive you used to go to, more dead than alive. Other gay pubs, clubs, and venues were an essential part of his world, but not the one where I had been a regular. To make a change from going to his favorite bars, I persuaded him to meet me at Hammersmith Bridge one Sunday afternoon, hoping he would like the busy riverside path. However he was not interested in any of the lively pubs we passed, not even those where we could have sat facing the river. After half an hour he was bored, and could not be bothered to visit the monument to the painter Hogarth in the graveyard of the old village church at Chiswick. We walked glumly on, coming to the path below terraces where, once a year, people stood to watch the Oxbridge boat race. He asked pointedly are we going anywhere, or are we just walking? His reaction, when I said we would reach a big pub after we crossed Chiswick Bridge, was a bored shrug. My attempts at conversation met with little or no response. Was this his way of telling me he was simply not interested in going anywhere at all that I might suggest? When we were walking across the bridge a spectacular road accident took place right in front of us. It began when a lorry pulled forward sharply, and shed seven or eight sacks of building materials. They lay on the road and partly across the footpath at the side. Unaware of leaving this hazard behind, the driver did not stop. Cars swerved haphazardly to avoid the obstruction, and disaster soon followed. One car bounced over a sack in the road, then crossed the central white line, forcing an oncoming van to swing sharply left. Mounting the footpath, it hit a pile of several sacks and careered over the parapet, plummeting into the river. It landed in three or four feet of water. The driver opened the cab door, saw us and shouted for help. I held up my phone and shouted back, I'll call 999. After I had called the police, Toby and I rushed back along the bridge to the bank. The driver had lowered himself into the river and was waiting towards us. With my camera phone I took some pictures of him, his partly immersed van in the background. His clothes were soaking wet. Are you all right? I asked. I've called the police. Should we get an ambulance? Fucking car was coming straight at me. Nothing I could do, not a fucking thing. I suggested he sat down on a low wall nearby. He was a fit looking man in his late thirties. After a few deep breaths he cursed, fucking bridge, fucking Sunday deliveries, fucking river, fucking soaking, fucking shite all over the fucking road. 
You sure you're not hurt? Shook up, but no. Couple of bruises maybe. He sat quietly for a minute or so. Thanks for 20. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Stopping. No other fucker did. You got through on the phone. Yes. You see, over there, that's a police launch on its way. I got a few pictures. I showed them to him and he said, not bad. The fucking van can stay in the river for all I care. Sorry. Take no notice of me. Suppose it could have been worse. At least it was the return trip with an empty van. When he stood up his wet trousers clung to his skin and he pulled the cloth loose. Defying misfortune he joked, suppose it'll save having a bath, won't it? I laughed, glad he felt recovered enough to make a joke. Toby, however, was becoming edgy. He said, listen mate, we're already late. Help's on its way. You mind if we? Yeah, no need for you to hang about. Do you have a phone number, in case I need a witness? I gave him mine, and agreed to send him the pictures from my phone. We shook hands. It was mean to leave him like that, but Toby was already off over the bridge at speed. When I caught up with him he said, began to think we'd be stuck there all day. The wet trousers turning you on, were they? How different he was from Dale, who had he been present would have taken charge of the situation, made absolutely sure the man was not hurt, and known exactly what to do. Over lunch in the pub I said, all of the times I've come down to the river, this is the first time anything really out of the ordinary has happened. Oh, fantastic things happen to me all the time, he answered. Quite sexy, the way his wet trousers clung, wasn't it? How can you talk about the poor man like that? He was lucky not to have been badly injured, and all you can think about is his clinging wet trousers. You were getting an eyeful too, don't pretend otherwise. Anyway, what about wet t-shirt competitions? Everyone thinks they're sexy. Wonder how you'd look in one? Have to get you under the shower in a t-shirt and a pair of white shorts. See what it does for you. Having my super attractive boyfriend enjoy the idea of seeing me like that drove any doubts about his attitude to the accident from my mind. All I wanted was to get back to his flat to have sex. 21. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 4. Dale had been raised in Northampton, where his parents still lived, but he had an elderly aunt in South London. Recently, due to failing health, she had given up her large suburban semi and moved into a care home. He was prevailed upon to clear out her belongings so the house could be sold. His aunt was keen on crime fiction and had accumulated hundreds of books, so he asked me to go down to see if they were worth anything. He had been rather low lately because of more delays with the, the new hospital laundry, and I was happy to go, if only to keep him company. There is no real money to be made from second-hand mass-market paperbacks. If she owned a good dictionary, atlas, encyclopedia, or collectible cookery books Jeremy might get his wallet out, but he would not want ordinary detective stories. Dale knew of an old family Bible, but another relative was keen to take that as an heirloom. We traveled by train from Victoria Station to a suburb with streets and streets of semi-detached houses. His aunts with a large bow window and Tudor effect boards on the facade, was one of 200 in a long avenue. We went in and he showed me several rooms with shelves full of books. I picked a few paperbacks out at random, some crime fiction and a romantic novel. Not really stuff for an antiquarian bookshop, maybe more a question of someone taking them off your hands. He pointed to an Agatha Christie. She's still popular. On TV, certainly. Paperback reprints of her books are common. Trouble is there too a penny. Your aunt took good care of them, but rarity is what makes an old book valuable. These paperbacks may have been precious to the old lady, but sentimental value doesn't convert into cash. He pointed out some book club editions of Dickens, attractively bound in leather. What about these? They'll fetch something, but you can probably still get the same or very similar editions new, 
so they're not hugely sought after. No disrespect to your aunt, but I wonder if they've ever been read. He was disappointed. Not wanting to be insensitive, in a more kindly tone I said, this place is really homely, well cared for, she must have loved it here. Yes, it meant so much to her. When I was a kid I used to love coming to visit. She had things hidden away in the cupboards, playing cards, old board games, even a film projector. The garage and garden sheds were packed with stuff. She used to let me explore. Wanted to keep me out of mischief, probably. Part of his childhood was going with the sale of the house. No wonder he was sad. I reached out and touched his shoulder sympathetically. Suddenly serious he said, to change the subject dramatically, Ben, there is something. Before he finished, I happened to glance down, and noticed on a low shelf a hardback with Lloyd Larcher's name on the spine. What's this? I broke in, bending to pick up the book. It was not a Jenny Moore, not a Jenny Less. A quick glance inside told me it was published in 1962. No reprints were listed, and I realized that in my hands was an unblemished first edition, complete with dust jacket. 22. Copyright Alan Kesslian. The first sentence of the blurb read, When two cousins with the same name fall in love with the same man, an astonishing intrigue develops. We might be onto something here, Dale, this is a first edition. I told you, didn't I, that Lloyd Larcher was the speaker at that dinner Jeremy took me to? He gave me his card, though we've not been in contact again. Oh yes, Lloyd Larcher. He was quite famous, wasn't he? Your aunt might have been one of his fans. Let's see if she has any others. We searched the bookcases and pulled out more Larcher first editions, together with other books that ought be worth more than a pittance. Among them were a dozen or more biographies, several cookery books and some lavishly illustrated volumes on astrology. They were enough to make it worth asking Jeremy what he thought. I'd better let my aunt know, in case she wants to keep any. I'll ring her tonight. She doesn't have much space for her personal stuff. You don't want anything yourself. I'm getting the hall clock for clearing the house. It's a good one. Other members of the family have had china, bits of furniture, old family photos. When the house is sold the money will be invested to help pay for her care. She's not expecting much for the books. The next day I showed Jeremy the list of potentially valuable books we had found. Well done, Ben, this is very professional. Have a word with Dale and fix a time for us to go round. Best if it's out of shop hours. I'll offer a good price, but don't build up his expectations. The Lloyd Larchers are promising. You seldom see his political novel about the population explosion, so very many more, not so many less, for sale. Most of the list, though, are not what you would call rare books, difficult to know what they'd fetch. We fixed up an evening for the three of us to go to the house in Jeremy's van. The passenger seat was just large enough for two. I sat in the middle, unable to move further towards Jeremy because of the handbrake, and trying not to lean too hard on Dale when we cornered. Jeremy talked all the time about how he admired people who did socially valuable jobs in the National Health Service, about how demanding the work must be, and how generally underrated the public sector was. Then he made me cringe with embarrassment by saying, and of course it's good to know that someone sensible and reliable is looking after Ben. Dale leaned comfortingly towards me and said, we look after each other. It's a good arrangement. When we reached the house we took in empty cardboard boxes and put them on the floor of the lounge. Jeremy checked through the copies of Lloyd's novels. Yes, he said, I think she has them all, every one. Splendid, every one a first edition in top condition. Not signed though. He sniffed the pages of one of them, something he occasionally did to books in the shop. First editions of this one. He continued, not a Benny more, not a Benny less, are very hard to come by. It's about Ben's addiction in the 1950s. 
Most of the print run was lost in a fire at the distributor's warehouse. Only a few dozen survived. Reprints have sold well though, plenty of them around. Do Lloyd Larcher's books smell nice, Jeremy? I asked. Oh, a book of that age doesn't have much smell. You would pick me up on that, wouldn't you? Now Dale will think I spend half my time sniffing books. Very occasionally, say if an old book has been rebound, you can smell the solvents from the adhesive, but not enough to give a glue sniffer a kick. Die-hard book lovers enjoy the fresh smell of a new book, it's part of the obsession, I wouldn't call it substance abuse. Dale said, I probably shouldn't ask, but would the Larchers be worth more if he could be persuaded to sign them now? As a general rule a signed copy is worth a bit more, but it's something done mostly to help sales when a book comes out. Marketing people get up to all kinds of tricks. I don't know about getting him 23. Copyright Alan Kesslian. To sign them now, they've been out of print for so long. Worth letting him know the set has turned up though. I'll mention they are unsigned and see what he says. He might even know of a potential buyer. Having put Lloyd's first editions into a box, he picked up a book on astrology and flicked over the pages. Ah! Someone I know will definitely be interested in this. Pack all this lot up, boys, and let me have 15 minutes to see what's left on the shelves, in case you've missed anything. Dale put the kettle on for tea while I filled the boxes. Jeremy joined us in the kitchen, empty-handed and said, You did a thorough job, you too. I'll give you the number of a dealer who ships a lot of old paperbacks. Tell him how many there are, and if he has space he'll make an offer. If not they will have to go to a house clearance firm. Unless you want to try selling them yourself on the internet, but I fear that would be a lot of effort for not much return. On the way back to Fool Rose Court we picked up a meal at a Chinese takeaway, and Jeremy bought a bottle of good wine. By the time we had eaten we were ready to turn in. The next day he was in a trance-like state. He must have been up half the night examining the new acquisitions. He looked as though he had slept in his clothes, his shirt was crumpled, and his tie thrown back over his left shoulder. Using the excuse that he wanted to tackle the accounts, he retired to the office once we had opened up. I checked on him after about an hour, and saw him asleep at his desk. His head, sinking down, had come to rest on top of a Lloyd Larcher first edition. One of his shoelaces had come undone and straggled over the floor. I was tempted to sneak up and tie it to a leg of the desk, but chickened out, afraid he would fall and hurt himself when he stood up. He was back to normal the next day, and rang Lloyd to tell him about our discovery. The timing was bad though, a new omnibus edition of his novels was due out soon and he was, understandably, too occupied with that to be much interested in our hoard. I stood by the office door hoping that my presence would remind Jeremy to ask about the work he had mentioned at the Booksellers Guild dinner, but Lloyd must have remembered it himself without being prompted, for Jeremy said, yes, he is, and waved me over to take the phone. Lloyd explained that some time ago he had agreed to judge a short story competition. He needed help as he was about to go on a lecture tour in the US to promote his omnibus edition, and would not have time to do all the work himself. He wanted me to weed out the stories that exceeded the permitted length, were in very poor English, or were religious or political tracts masquerading as stories. A few days ago the organizers had told him that several hundred entries had come in, and many more were expected before the closing date. He thought four or five days work would be enough for me to go through and throw out the rubbish. I had never undertaken anything like this before, but the job sounded interesting, the money would be welcome, and it would be something to add to my CV. I said, I'm certainly interested. What was the competition called again? The Effingham and Meadow Goose International Short Story Competition. Effingham and what? Meadow Goose. Strange name, I know, but it is quite well known in some circles. I'm sure Jeremy will have heard of it. Have a word with him, and call me back with a definite yes or no. I'll be here the rest of the afternoon. 
Jeremy remembered seeing some leaflets about the competition years ago, in the local library. He thought lending Lloyd a hand was a good opportunity for me, and offered to watch the shop for a few extra hours to free a little of my time for the work. I called Lloyd back, and he said he would bring the entries to the shop in a week's time. So that, if he happened to ask whether I had read anything of his, I could honestly say yes, I began not a Kilkenny more, not a Kilkenny less, his novel about an Irish migrant who made a fortune in the US and named a suburb of Pittsburgh after his hometown. 24. Copyright Alan Kesslian. A week later a taxi pulled up outside the bookshop. Lloyd, followed by the driver carrying three boxes of entries for the Effingham and Meadow Goose International Short Story Competition, strode into the bookshop. Jeremy, wearing a double-breasted suit, a shirt with the collar button undone and a little check scarf around his neck, fluttered around his old acquaintance. He proudly held up one of the first editions, not a larceny more, not a larceny less. Ah yes, Lloyd said, the second of my two crime novels. That copy has survived the years well, better than I have. You look in excellent health, everyone says so. You wouldn't care to sign it, I suppose. Jeremy's public school accent was more noticeable than usual, his vowel somehow sounding rounded and staccato at the same time. Be glad to. Since you have the complete set, I may as well do them all. Give me a bit of book signing practice for when the omnibus edition comes out. Gosh, that would be stupendous. I really shouldn't put you to so much trouble. He passed Lloyd the one he held in his hand, I supplied a pen. Such a virtuoso demonstration of how crime narrative can be used to reveal the intrinsic nature of the major characters, Jeremy warbled as he watched Lloyd sign. The author's pink face glowed with satisfaction at this blatant flattery, and not to be outdone he responded in similarly ringing tones, you know I always wish I had made time to develop a little business acumen. You've achieved that rare ambience here that can be found only in a good bookshop. One has the sense of being in a treasure house where time simply melts away. Jeremy nodded to me and I brought the stack of first editions and put them down beside Lloyd. He signed and handed each one to me after doing so. They continued to preen one another with cringe-making compliments. Then they remembered old times for nearly half an hour, until Lloyd suddenly glanced at his watch and said, Good heavens, going to be late for a luncheon engagement. The competition. So good of you, Ben, to agree to help. If you could have a bit of a shuffle through the entries and sort out, say, eight to a dozen that are not too bad. I'll take it from there when I return from across the pond. All strictly between us, of course. One thing, no clever mummy stories please, can't abide them. Here's 20% of your fee as confirmation of our arrangement, if that's acceptable. Oh, yes, thank you, I said, surprised to be paid money in advance. He handed me a check and headed for the door, leaving Jeremy extremely pleased with himself, and me alarmed at not knowing more about what was wanted of me. Why has he given me an advance? He's wily. Accepting a payment means you have entered into a legally binding contract. If you changed your mind, it would be difficult for you to back out. Keep the check in your pocket if you're having doubts. No, not doubts about taking the job on. What did he mean by clever mummy stories? Really don't know. Something to do with Egyptian mummies coming back to life and terrorizing archaeologists, perhaps. No, he can't have meant that. The answer to my question became clear when I read the first few stories. Most were about, and probably written by, mothers with young children. One began this was the first time Jemima had come home from school with green hair, had anxious mummy and teacher discussing how Jemima was being led astray by the class minx, and ended with clever mummy inviting her daughter's errant school friend for a break in the family's holiday cottage in the Cotswolds, thereby bringing out the little tyke's better side. Oh what a clever mummy she was. That evening I stayed behind at the flat, working on the competition entries while Dale went to the give and take. When he returned alone, I said cheekily, no luck tonight then. 
Come on, how often have you seen me pick someone up in the give and take? Once, that's all. The 25. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Way you talk you would think I was anybody's. This was a good reply, and he watched me struggle to think of a follow-up that would not be another unfair dig. After a pause I said, no one at the give and take could rival those guys in your computer game, could they? He sat down beside me on the sofa and asked, how are you getting on with the competition? Started on it? Maybe I should put something in for it? I write stuff for the hospital newsletter. You've missed the closing date for this year. Anyway, what would you call it? Hospital laundry blues. I've written about much more than the hospital laundry. Finding the time would be my problem. I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe Lloyd Larcher should have asked you to help him. How many stories do you have to go through? Three boxes. You don't know how many, do you? Suppose you aim to do ten a day, a hundred would take you ten days. If there are a thousand, you will need a hundred days. You ought to count them and draw up a timetable. This suggestion was so obviously sensible I felt stupid for not having thought of it. Do people like Dale understand how irritating they are when they come up with good ideas like that? Did the National Health Service run courses on how to be cleverer than everybody else? How utterly different he was from Toby, whose answer to a problem would most likely be taking some pills or snorting some coke. Dale said he had arranged to spend the coming weekend with an old friend on the other side of London. Toby too was away visiting family. This left me with Sunday free to work on the stories, and I did as Dale suggested and counted them. There were more than 800. Skimming through half a dozen quickly gave me a headache and took nearly half an hour. One of them was about a christening, two were about weddings, two about experiences in hospitals, and the last was a long address to the congregation at the funeral of Charlie who in the last sentence was revealed to be a pet dog. I had a strong feeling I had read something very like it years ago. A quicker way had to be found. Would it be fair to read only the first few sentences, and drop any without a strong beginning? Doing that all day and most of the evening got me about halfway through the stack of entries. About one out of ten were good enough to be read more thoroughly. I was thinking of going down to the give and take for the last hour before closing when Dale returned. He brought with him a newspaper that carried an expose of Lloyd Larcher. Under the headline Author Rocked by Sex and Money Scandals, the article claimed that Lloyd had hired a male model to pose for erotic photographs, plied him with alcohol and made improper suggestions. The veteran author was also said to have misled the publisher of his first novel into believing he was an Oxford Don, to have got one of his books onto the bestseller list by inflating sales figures through a scam with a now-defunct book club, and to have accepted a large advance from a politician's widow for her husband's biography, which he never intended to write and of which she saw only a few fragments before her own demise. The paper's picture of the male model, a smiling young man in a lounge suit with salon-styled hair, must have been decades old. None of the scandals was recent. At the bookshop the next day Jeremy read the expose and commented, seeing all this old muck about Lloyd in print again makes me despair of the press. He may have got up to a few tricks in his time, but this is totally misleading. I happen to know he was relying on the politician's widow for material for that biography. When she died the decision to abandon it was taken by the publisher, not Lloyd, who had put in a lot of time for little recompense. None of this is new. Ignore it, that's my advice. How are you getting on with the competition? 26. Copyright Alan Kesslian. I told him that there was not enough time to read through all the entries. He at once suggested ringing Lloyd in the US to ask his advice. He found, searching on the internet, that Lloyd was due to speak at the University of Buffalo, rang their number and handed me the phone. While I was waiting to be put through, Jeremy thought it very funny to say that he did not understand why buffaloes needed a university, as he thought hunters had wiped them all out years ago. Luckily Lloyd was on the premises. He cheerfully dismissed my worries about the number of competition entries. 
Good heavens Ben, you mustn't try to read them all, you'll drive yourself mad, you silly boy. Have a shuffle through and find me about a dozen or twenty that aren't too bad, that's all I asked you to do. Throw out any that are too long, any claptrap about elves and goblins or child magicians, and then ditch all the clever mummy stories. Shuffle through the others to find me some that are written in good English, preferably a bit of variety, original fantasy, people coping with life's crises, I don't mind the odd love story, or some humor, whatever. Am I making sense? Yes, of course, I've rejected quite a few clever mummy stories already. On a different subject, I'm not sure whether you know, but some awful stuff about you has appeared in the newspapers over here. Jeremy says it's all old gossip. I knew some ancient scandals were about to get a fresh airing. You're too young to remember, but years ago some murky rumors about me were reported in the press. My publisher is responsible for reviving them. He has someone who specializes in feeding juicy titbits to journalists. The omnibus edition is due out in a couple of weeks, and with me over here out of reach they're giving the press hacks a lot of bullshit to get publicity. They provided me with a statement, denying everything as stale old gossip based on malice and misunderstandings. Sad fact, but scandal has become the best way to sell books these days. A dear friend of mine came off far worse. His publisher forced him to go into politics to keep his name in front of the public. Modern publishers have absolutely no scruples about what they force us to do. Well, must go. Have to sing for my supper while I'm over here, you know. Over the next few weeks I continued to work on the competition as conscientiously as the time allowed. Dale offered to read through some of them, and I gave him one with gay characters, an amusing story about two men trying too hard to impress each other. He read that and liked it, and then showed me an article of his in an old hospital newsletter about the treasurer of the staff holiday club stealing the funds, as if the Effingham and Meadow Goose material was not too much to cope with already. If I changed the setting and the names, would it stand a chance as a competition entry, he asked. You're not trying to get me to sneak it onto my shortlist, are you? No. I was thinking of, perhaps, putting it in for next year. 27. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 5. One night smiles turned up at Toby's South London Club. By this time the faces of many of the regulars were familiar to me, though I seldom spoke to any of them. Smiles, out of his usual haunt, was relieved to see someone he knew. So this is where you've been choosing to spend your time, and money, he said. Hanging round as usual waiting for Toby, I was glad to see him. Toby's choice. This place is his playing field. Playing the field, more like. He nodded towards my boyfriend, who was dancing with a sweet-faced girl I had never seen before. People mostly danced without touching, in whatever little free space they could find, but Toby and the girl were holding each other close, rubbing their bodies suggestively against one another. In that place, jealousy over a bit of flirtatious showing off would be bizarrely possessive. He knows all the regulars. At times it's as if he knows the whole of London. A change for you, coming here. To talk more easily we walked past the toilets to the open area outside. He had come because the owners of the give and take were planning a new late night venue, and wanted him to investigate the competition. This place always fills up, I said. It's buzzing, I'll say that for it, but how to go about creating the buzz to start with? The scene is not really for me, too frenetic, I'm not the right person to talk to about what draws people in. I expect they're making money though, takings on the door are probably good, wonder what the drink sales are like. High prices. You see people come in, meet friends, dance, some of them go to the bar, some not. A venue like this becomes the place to be seen, but it won't necessarily last, a new club opens and people go there instead, or troublemakers drive away the decent customers. Late night clubs are so different to the give and take, where it's a friendly bar and there's hardly ever any trouble. 
Bet the gay symphony orchestra are not coming in here to rehearse. No prospect of toying with the trombonist tonight. You've moved on from the clarinetist, then. There's a whole orchestra for me to play with, remember. You're as bad as Toby. I'd forgotten how you always take everything literally. What I'd really like now is someone steady in my life. Working at the give and take there's too much temptation. We went back inside to find the club busier than before. I wonder how many are crammed in tonight. Bet there are more than health and safety rules permit, he said. Don't look round, but a woman over there has just pointed at you. Now she's heading this way. Boy with her is not bad. That the Jays should turn up was no surprise. The club was mixed straight and gay, and their type of place. I introduced them to Smiles as the couple with the music system. He asked them if they missed 28. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Having me as a neighbor. Jade said, he still comes round to his old flat sometimes, but he doesn't come up to see us. We get told plenty though. She turned to me. No use you thinking you've got away from us that easy. Does Toby know you're here at his club with your friend? He's over there, I said, waving towards him. Oh yeah, she said. Busy as usual. Why don't we all dance? Jake suggested. We found enough space on the floor for the four of us. After a couple of minutes smiles danced up close to me. Speaking loudly in order to be heard, he said in my ear, I wouldn't mind finding myself in a dark corner with your friend Jake. Bet she keeps him on a short lead. Guess I've seen enough of the club. Would it be okay if I leave you to it? I gave him a thumbs up and mouth yes. The Jays were making regular eye contact with me and smiling. Even after he had gone, with them for company I felt more at ease in that place than usual. Toby, at the other end of the room, waved to us, but made off in another direction to see one of his regular contacts. The club was always hot, and dancing made us hotter still. The Jays followed me to the bar to get drinks, and I leaned forward so the barman could hear me. Jake was so close behind me I could feel him against my back. He reached out an arm to take his drink from the bar and leaned firmly on me. A lot of straight men think that to act a bit gay now and again shows how cool they are, so I ignored him. No one took much notice, not even Jade who was right next to us. I turned around to face him. How you doing, mate, he asked, looking me in the eye. He put his hands on either side of me on the bar surface, pinning me to the spot. She regarded us calmly and said, good in here, isn't it Ben? Like, it's a nice free and easy type of place. His face was two inches from mine. He said, you come here because Toby drags you along, don't you? Ever thought it was time to let him know he shouldn't take you for granted? He's right, isn't he, she said, putting a hand on my shoulder. As she spoke, Toby came up behind him and startled him by saying, put him down, you don't know where he's been. Jade was ready with a riposte. You're lucky he's still here, the way you go off and leave him lying around. Serve you right if somebody took him home with them. We're not the only ones who've been eyeing him up. He's saving himself for me. He's a good boy, aren't you Ben? He enjoyed making me out to be gullible. What did the three of them really think of me? That I was too dim to keep up in their game of grab every thrill that's going? Jake, suddenly serious, said in my ear, I know what you're thinking. We're crap, aren't we? You think us turning up is like finding you've got some dog shit stuck on your shoe. Jade and Toby, not able to make out fully what he said in the general din, laughed uncertainly. His speculation about my thoughts surprised me, particularly on a night when, for the first time, their company had actually been welcome. No, why do you say that? I'm glad you're here. Toby cut in, that's enough. No more taking advantage of him, you two, not without my say so, anyway. To me he said. Come on, we can go now, if you're ready. 
Despite feeling a wimp for doing so, I obediently followed him out. Having left the hot stale air of the club we walked to a corner where it was easy to hail a taxi. For something to say I asked him about the woman he had been dancing with. Not going to be jealous because of that, are you? Who am I with now? Then, as an afterthought, he added, besides, I am bisexual, you know. I did not know, and thought it highly unlikely. He was no more bi than I was. He had said that to worry me, to make clear to me that he was the top dog. I only asked who she was, I said sharply. 29. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Don't worry about her, Toby replied. Her boyfriend wasn't far away. He's not someone you cross. You can forget about her. How sure of himself he was, thinking that seeing him with the girl had made me jealous. A denial, though, would have sounded hollow, so I said coolly, you never told me you were bi. Do you have a girlfriend at the moment? What? Do you have a girlfriend at the moment? He waggled his hand in a maybe, maybe not gesture, unable to think of a smart answer. The topic was evidently closed. This was how he was all the time. Scoring points was the closest he came to meaningful conversation. When we were back at his flat we shagged without much enthusiasm, more than ever we seemed to share nothing except sex. Being with him was, I supposed, better than having no boyfriend at all. During the last few weeks there had been odd mornings when Dale had not been around, a sign he was staying overnight with pickups, or possibly that he too had found a boyfriend. He had not volunteered any information, but why should he, since I never talked to him about my relationship with Toby? We had other things to talk about, he was interested in my progress with the Effingham and Meadow Goose International Short Story Competition, at times making me feel as though he was supervising, as if it was one of his projects at work. Hearing that Lloyd had told me by phone to shuffle through and find a dozen stories that weren't bad, he let me know he did not approve. All of the stories, he said, ought to be read through by several people and assessed against an agreed list of criteria. This idea was reasonable, but it would have taken lots more time than Lloyd, who clearly wanted only minimum effort, had allowed. If Dale had been organizing the competition from the start he might have argued for a fairer system and talked Lloyd round, but to change the process now would be impracticable. He must have guessed what was going through my mind, for he said, always so easy to tell someone else how they should do things, but nothing I have to deal with myself is ever simple. The way you're doing it is more spontaneous, perhaps it's right for the competition. The thing is, you know if you want a bit of help with anything, or just to talk to someone, do ask me if I can help, I will. Have you found any more stories with a gay theme? Yes, one. And it's one of the better ones. Good enough for the shortlist, I think. Changing the subject, there is something I wanted to ask you, as a favor. Go on. You know my aunt, the one in the nursing home whose books you sorted out? I've mentioned having a new flatmate a couple of times, and that we're friends. Well, last time I went to see her she said, if you could find time one day, she would like to meet you. I know you're busy with the competition now, and going to a nursing home to see an elderly relative of mine is lot to ask. You don't have to, I'll understand if you'd rather not. He must have said nice things to her about me, and of course I said yes. He took me down to the home, near Kingston-upon-Thames, on a Thursday afternoon. On our way to the front door, through the windows we could see in the sitting room several old ladies in big armchairs watching television, and others staring through the windows at the world outside. To my eyes they were not noticeably older than Lloyd Larcher, who went on lecture tours in the US, had his omnibus edition coming out and was judge of a short story competition. The home's residents had, apparently, settled into a much more limited kind of existence. Dale's aunt had her own room, on the first floor. She got up slowly from her chair to welcome us. Her hair was iron grey and her skin sallow, but she took my hand firmly and smiled, putting me at ease. 
I'm so glad you've come, she said, it's lovely to have visitors. She had an electric kettle and some cups 30. Copyright Alan Kesslian. On a tray, and made us tea. When she sat down again she said to Dale, show Ben that picture of you, over there. On a small sideboard she had half a dozen framed family photographs, and he handed me one taken of him when he was in school uniform. He was in the fifth form then, she said. He was a good-looking boy, his eyes clear and bright, his youthful skin free of blemishes. Seeing him day after day his appearance had become familiar, unremarkable, but the photo reminded me that he was attractive, and given his personality he would surely, one day, make someone a good boyfriend. Had we not started off as friends and moved on to being flatmates, perhaps he and I might have had a fling. People you come to know as friends tend to remain friends, you think of going out somewhere together, not of having sex. Only later, on the way home, did the thought come into my mind that, should Dale one day find a boyfriend, he might no longer want me as a flatmate. His aunt asked me about the bookshop and if many of the books from her house had been sold. She also told me of the lady in the next room, who had been headmistress of an infant's school. This heavily built woman had fallen over the day before, and three of the staff were needed to help her back on her feet. Then she asked Dale to check at reception to see if the postman had brought any letters for her, a rather obvious contrivance to enable her to talk to me alone. I'm so pleased that Dale has someone reliable to share with, she began. He was never one for being on his own. He has always been good-natured, and the trouble with being good-natured is that people take advantage of you. The world has so many people who are of the opposite kind. You moving in with him has cheered him up, you know. He needed that. It's very nice of you to say that. Sharing with him has been good for me too. You know I'm a great fan of crime fiction. Are you two going to be like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, she asked, laughing. I don't think we'll ever be as famous as that. Probably better not to live so dangerously. Dale returned with a white envelope which he handed to her. Oh, that's just the bank, she said. Ben was telling me how much he likes the flat. Do you know, I've never seen it? Why don't you bring me a photo of it, with the two of you, of course. I'm not sure if we have one, he said. Well, you could take one, couldn't you? He promised he would, and when she began to tire, we left. As we walked to the station I said, she's really nice. She cares a lot about you, doesn't she? That photograph of you she has, I almost said y'all looked gorgeous, but realized how the comment would sound and stopped myself, embarrassed. He regarded me quizzically, but at that moment my phone rang and saved me from having to end the sentence. Lloyd enjoyed his US lecture tour, and returned in good spirits. A week later, after accepting my competition shortlist without question, he had chosen the winner. He invited me to call at his flat to thank me for my help and, as he put it, to settle my account. I was worried about leaving Jeremy on his own in the shop because in the wet and windy weather of the last few days he had caught flu. He was very sensitive to drafts, and not wanting to face customers sat all morning in the office trying to do paperwork. He had swathed himself in a thick pullover, a twee jacket, and what Smiles calls his Sherlock Holmes cape. I made him frequent hot drinks and persuaded him to let me shut the shop for a couple of hours in the afternoon while I went to see Lloyd, who lived a bus ride away in a building near Regent's Park. Dear boy, delighted to see you, he said, with his customary old world charm. He left me for a few minutes to bring refreshments. I admired his Sheraton furniture and Dutch landscapes until he came back carrying a laden silver tray. He said he hoped the Effingham and Meadow Goose work had not been too onerous, and I asked him what he had thought of the story about a gay couple quarreling all 31. Copyright Alan Kesslian The time when they were on holiday, but beginning to behave normally towards each other during their journey home. Oh yes, definitely one of the better ones. Had to rule it out, of course. 
have to remember the political climate at the Effingham and Meadow Goose. A story with a positive attitude to gay men would never be accepted by the committee. What political climate? A very fundamentalist conservative group has taken over the competition. It used to be the plain old Effingham Ways Geos Prize for Writers, run by the owner of the nearby print works. A Ways Geos, as I'm sure you know, is the print worker's Christmas festive dinner. When the works closed down the competition was taken over by the right-wing parish council and renamed. They added international to make it sound more important, and Meadow Goose after the nearby Goose Meadow. Not being political myself, I was in two minds about being this year's judge, but the fee is not bad and frankly, quite a few years have gone by since my last book, so a little extra money helps, well, let's say helps me pay my tailor's bills. Of course my books provided a good living for me in their day, but thrift was never one of my strong points. He glanced around at his expensive furnishings. Perhaps I should be more principled, and insist on awarding the prize to the story about the same-sex couple, but at my age the enthusiasm for fighting battles. Talking of your success, I said, can I ask you something? You know I'm working for Jeremy in his bookshop, and obviously the job is fine, but sometimes I do wonder if it is going to be my lifelong career. Trouble is I still haven't really worked out what I want to do in life. Your novels did so brilliantly well. Did you always know that writing was the thing for you? Not really. My first taste of being published was in a local newspaper. I was a journalist for some years before my first book came out. Don't ask me why it should be, but, for me, the titles have been the key to success. Incredible, but a particular form of words proved vital. You may have noticed nearly all my books are called not a something more, not a something less, with the something always a word ending in any. Any or any, it didn't matter. So long as the title conformed to that pattern, the books were successful, from not a progeny more, not a progeny less to not an abergavany more, not an abergavana less. If I strayed from that format even a little, they didn't sell. For instance, my novel about slanderous accusations raised against a peer of the realm, never a calumny more, never a calumny less, was a complete flop. That is why I dried up. If you think about it, not all that many words do end in any or any. Afraid you won't find what I'm saying a lot of help, but whatever field you're hoping to make your fortune in, you simply have to find something that will work for you, not necessarily a catchphrase, but some memorable, striking little thing that people will remember you by, a sort of key that will open up the gate to success. You have to open your mind to the possibilities. He was surely well-intentioned, but his advice was rather like telling me that the secret of success was to find something or other that would help me do well. Undeniable, but not specific enough to be any use. Well, thanks, have to keep hunting for that key, I suppose. By the way, you didn't ever, did you? write a novel called Not a Hapenny More, Not a Hapenny Less. Good Lord, never thought of that. Not a Hapenny More, Not a Hapenny Less. He gestured oddly with his right hand as though spotting paint onto a canvas. Potential. It has definite potential. A creative gleam came into his eye. Well, mustn't keep you, dear boy, know how busy you are. He got up and from his desk fetched an envelope with my name on it, and a thick book wrapped in brown paper. What we agreed, plus a little bonus for diligence, thought you deserved it? Also advance orders for the omnibus edition of my novels are coming in well, and here you are, you're welcome to a signed copy, well done. Perhaps you and I will cooperate again on another project in the future, you never know what will come up. Not a hop any more not a hop any less. Never thought of it, I'll be damned. On the bus home I unwrapped the book and found that above his signature he had written the 32. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Message to Ben, may he find happiness and fulfillment in his life's odyssey. Then I read the long list of his novels on the dust jacket. Not a progeny more, not a progeny less.
Aristocratic Giles is heir to the family estates, but to receive his inheritance he must have exactly seven children. Not a blenny more, not a blenny less. Ruthless competition between fishermen for the biggest catch leads to tragedy in the North Sea. Not a Jenny more, not a Jenny less. Jenny believes she has found happiness with the man of her dreams, until her cousin, also called Jenny, comes to stay. So very many more, not so many less. As the population rises, the government introduces restrictions on numbers of offspring. The result is turmoil on the streets. Not a Benny more, not a Benny less. Emerging amphetamine addiction in the 1950s leads a fashionable Harley Street psychiatrist to the depths of depravity. Not a Kilkenny more, not a Kilkenny less. An Irish emigre in the US causes consternation in the city of his ancestors when he proposes to name a suburb of Pittsburgh after his hometown. Not a larceny more, not a larceny less. Two crack jewel thieves compete with each other in a series of ever more daring raids. Not a Rennie more, not a Rennie less. Giants of the pharmaceutical industry engage in a ruthless war for dominance in an effervescent market sector. Not a villainy more, not a villainy less. In the second of the author's much praised crime fiction novels, veteran burglar Chalky Faw Sentry plans to go straight after a last raid, his hundredth robbery of a stately home. Never a calumny more, never a calumny less. Ace Detective Rhombus foils a malicious plot to undermine a noble and honorable lord of the realm with outlandish and unfounded scandal. Not a Fenimore, not a Fenniless. A spoof Wild West saga. In a gold rush town pillaged by Indians and lawless gunmen, two hairdressers feud over who will tend the prospector's coiffure, until they have to join forces to avoid losing their own scalps. Not an Abergavenny more, not an Abergavenny less. Worthies of the town are astonished when a delegation arrives from South America claiming to be 33. Copyright Alan Kesslian. From a thriving Welsh colony founded over a century ago in the rainforest. 34. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 6. Toby was keen to go to a new fetish club that the Jays had told him about where everyone dressed up in rubber, leather, or goth gear. He had no strong leanings towards any of those things as far as I knew, but it was somewhere new and different. He said black jeans and t-shirt, with a little macabre touch such as skull and crossbones earrings or exaggerated black eyeshadow, would do as minimal costume. I thought the club might be a good laugh, and at least it would be a change from his usual dive. For my token fetish touch I bought two push-on vampire teeth from a fancy dress shop. They were just right, not grotesquely large, but protruding over my lower lip enough to be noticed. Wearing them I stole up on Dale when he was combing his hair in the bathroom. He looked at me in the mirror, puzzled, and I opened my mouth wide and made as thought to bite his neck. Do you know, he said, unperturbed by my plastic fangs, that mirrors do not reflect the image of vampires? It's a well-known non-fact. A well-known non-fact. Nothing to do with people turning into vampires is fact, is it? Will you still think that after I've bitten you? Please don't, this is a clean shirt. You look good though. I'm not being ironic, a hint of danger can be appealing. You off out somewhere. I told him about the new club. At first he seemed interested, but was put off on hearing that Toby and the Jays were going. Otherwise he might have let me drag him along. He was tired anyway from working even later than usual on a reorganization in the outpatient clinics. Going with him to the give and take for half an hour might have cheered him up, but it was too late to change my arrangement with Toby and the Jays. Reluctantly I left him to watch television, or find relief in his erotic computer game. On reaching Toby's flat I regretted leaving Dale on his own more than ever. Toby opened the door wearing a leather kilt, black eyeshadow and black lipstick. I felt obliged to say the effect was fantastic. He clearly thought that it was wonderful, but twirling around in his stupid kilt, his face made ugly by grotesque makeup, to me he looked awful. My usual pride over being with someone so attractive would have to be suspended that night. Increasingly, 
what other people thought was unimportant. Whether we were happy or miserable depended ultimately on the two of us. For me the fetish club was a sideshow, an hour or two's potentially amusing distraction. For him it was evidently a big event, worth a lot of preparation. Used to being able to have pretty well anyone he wanted, he was always self-confident. He pushed me onto the sofa and said, fuck me, those teeth do something for you. We've got time before we go. You can give me a thrill right now. What about your makeup? Oh, yeah, don't mess that up, be careful. He grabbed my hand and put it under his kilt, but as he did his phone rang. He could never resist answering it straight away. After listening for a few moments 35. Copyright Alan Kesslian. He said, yes, but we don't need to rush, do we? What? Oh, okay. He ended the call. Sorry, sexy. The Jays are on their way in a taxi. They're at the corner of the road. Like Toby, they had dressed up far more than me. Each wore a tight-fitting black latex top. His had a hood that, pulled up, covered his head except for his eyes, nose, and mouth, her top had ribbed bra cups, very low at the front, exposing the upper surface of her breasts and revealing her nipples. You'll do, she said to Toby. They'll all be wondering what you've got on under that kilt. But what about him? Where does he think he's going? His auntie's Halloween party? Come here. She took a stick of face paint from her handbag and told me to sit down. I submitted to having black lines painted on my cheeks and forehead. They had let their cab go, so Toby phoned for another to take us to the club. God knows what the driver must have thought as we climbed in. When we descended the steps to the fetish bar we found only half a dozen others. Four were wearing black clothes that might have come from any high street shop, only two were in fetish gear a man wearing a long black priest's robe, and a woman in rubber trousers with oval openings at the back that exposed half her buttocks. All had improbably black hair. Behind the bar was a mural of a moonlit gothic ruin surrounded by bats and howling wolves. Cocktails on promotion included a sweet, gooey green liquid called Triffid Juice, and a purple concoction called Viper's Blood. Shortly after we sat down, Jade took a box from her bag with the words a gift for you written on it and handed it to me. Here you are Ben, she said, unusually sweetly. We spotted this in a novelty shop and thought you'd like it. She had no reason to give me a present, and holding it at arm's length I suspiciously tugged at a flap in the wrapping on the side. With a startling whooping sound, a three-foot black balloon in the shape of a phallus rose into the air in front of me. Everyone else in the bar saw what I was holding and fell around laughing. Concealing my embarrassment and indignation, I laughed too, pretending to find the huge dick funny, and said loudly, just what I've always wanted. In a different situation I might have thought the prank funny, but in that place, in front of strangers I felt that she had humiliated me. Jake read my true feelings and said, sorry mate. He took the balloon from me and tugged at something inside to deflate it. He patted my knee and said, it's just a joke, let it go. Tell you what, come and dance with me. This is not a gay club, is it? Come on, who's going to worry about that? That bloke in the black frock, or that woman with her arse hanging out? Toby wanted to check out the group at the bar and said, go on Ben, let's see how you and Jake move together. Have a try at making me jealous. The music, more like screams of aggression than a song, was hard to dance to. Jake pulled me to him and said, let's take up his challenge, try and make him jealous, what do you say? You might be the one who should worry about being jealous. The other night Toby told me he was bisexual. Maybe he fancies Jade. Everyone's supposed to be a bit bi, aren't they? Including me in case you're wondering. See Toby and that bloke now, is he chatting him up? It's nice to have a change, sometimes, isn't it? Loosen up, Ben, don't be inhibited. Take an E to help you get into it. You don't want to miss out. 
My guess was that Toby was more likely to be selling pills to the man at the bar, not chatting him up. The music of drum beats and relentless screams ended, and I broke away from Jake's arms. We went back to the table, where Jade hurriedly finished talking to someone on her phone. You two were dancing very close she said. You on the turn, Jake. What of it? Suppose he is someone I could go for. She laughed. Oh, get you. You'll be painting your nails next. Come and have a dance with me now, Ben. Ought to be turn and turn about, if that's how it's going to be. Yeah, go on, he said, I'll get in the drinks. 36. Copyright Alan Kesslian. While Jade and I danced, I saw him speak briefly to Toby at the bar. The music improved, she moved well, showing a good sense of rhythm, but we did not dance close. When we rejoined Jake there were only three drinks on the table. I take it Toby's found other interests, I said. You're all right with us, Jake answered, don't bother about him. What do you think of the place? Never been anywhere like this before, I'll give it that. Not many people in, though. Quiet night. Seen anything you like? Do I fancy anyone here, you mean? Not really. Halfway through the beer Jake had bought for me I began to feel extraordinarily tired. The Jays tried to get me up to dance again, but my leg muscles would not work properly and I sank back into the seat. They sounded odd, as though they were talking to me from a long distance away, and I could not make out what they were saying. A little later Toby came over, lifted my head up, leaned over me and said in my ear, Ben, mate, you're all in. Jade and Jake are going to take you back to the flat now, I've got a couple of things to do. You like Jake, don't you? He likes you. So does Jade. Just go back with them, they'll see you're okay. I'll catch up with you later. My recollection of what happened after that is unclear. They must have walked me out of the club and pushed me into a taxi. Toby must have given them the keys to his flat, for I remember going in and Jade wiping my face clean of makeup. They put me to bed, and got in with me. They did not force themselves on me, I lacked the will to refuse what they wanted me to do. It was as though the conscious, thinking, normal me was suspended and only a kind of physical, sex toy version of me remained. I was dimly aware that I had been drugged, and this chemically modified me responded to what was demanded of it, shifting from one position to another, and thrusting this way or that as required. The next morning I woke alone in Toby's bed. My private parts were tender, leaving no question that sex had taken place. My Dracula teeth were missing. A hangover, like the aftereffects of being hit hard on the head, seared my brain. A message on my mobile phone from Toby said he would be out for the day until late. The effort of reading his few words made my head pound. Finding my clothes and dressing made me feel nauseous. Recovering from that night took me all day. Except for leaving the message on my phone, Toby did not contact me again, nor I him. Jake, however, sent me a couple of friendly messages, which I ignored. Then he rang me at work a couple of days later. Jeremy was in the shop, making it difficult for to me tell him how disgusted I was with him, and with Jade. What I truly wanted was for the excruciating memory of being in bed with them in Toby's flat to fade as quickly as possible. He was determined to meet me, and intending to let him know my feelings I agreed to meet him the next day at lunchtime. It was a sunny day and we took sandwiches to the park nearby. He must have noticed my stern expression, for straight away he said, I get the feeling you're not too happy. You're right about that. Why not? Because Toby's went off and left you with us. He waited for my response, but getting only a hostile glare said, Do you think he saves himself for you? No, it's so easy for him to get anyone he wants. I did think of him as my boyfriend, even so. He's the same as he's always been. Okay, let's say he's your boyfriend but other than that he's the same old Toby, he goes with anyone he fancies. 
Ask yourself what's so special about him. He's got the looks, but what else? You know that he's screwing your flatmate. Those words he's screwing your flatmate were like a smack in the face. I had assumed that he was picking other guys up, but not that he had seen Dale again. Trying, but failing, to hide my incredulity, I said, you seem to know a lot about it. 37. Copyright Alan Kesslian. I'm in the flat upstairs. I've seen them together. Toby hasn't exactly been hiding what's going on, except from you. He plays games, he's showing off, proving he can get anyone to do whatever he wants. He boasted to me you didn't have a clue about him and Dale. He was the one who suggested Jade and I give you a threesome to bring you out of yourself more. You acted as if you were enjoying it all right. We certainly did. We sat in silence for more than a minute. He shuffled his feet and sighed. Oh fuck. That isn't what I wanted to say to you at all. You must think I'm as big a shit as Toby is. The thing is Ben, I really do like you. I've never seriously gone for guys before. Toby and I tried it once, but it did nothing for me, it was going through the motions, an effort, probably, for him too. Once with a kid at school. I slept over at his house, we played around. Kids fool around with their mates a bit, don't they? With you it's completely different. You've got to me, really got to me. Understand what I'm saying. Jake was not unattractive, and he could be good company, but I had never thought of him as someone to sleep with. To me he and Jade were a straight couple. Some people, for all sorts of reasons, you do not think of in a sexual kind of way. Did he assume that, simply because he fancied me, I ought to have sex with him? I had never done anything to encourage him. Sorry, this is too much for me. Half an hour ago my impression was that Toby was my boyfriend, to some extent anyway, Dale was my flatmate, and you and Jade were a fun-loving straight couple who never knew when to say no. Now you tell me none of it is true. Jade is your girlfriend, your partner. Isn't she? Wise up, Ben. Lots of people have open relationships. Think about what I said. It would be different with me, not like it is with Toby. I've got respect for you. You'd be someone special. We could have fun together, the two of us. Why not? Everyone else does. Who the hell was he to tell me how to live my life? Despite being angry, and dazed by what he had said about Toby and Dale, for him to say he fancied me was flattering. But what was he after? To have me as a bit of gay fun on the side while he continued with Jade as before, neither of us ever to feel jealous or possessive. He evidently had no inkling of anything being wrong with what they had done to me the other night. Anyway, I wanted someone who cared about me, who would be there when life got tough. I said, you think I'm likely to want a relationship, after you doped me in that fetish club and did what you did. We were helping you get rid of your inhibitions. That's not how I see it. We gave you a good time. All right, you're not happy about it now, so obviously we went too far. Give it a few more days. You might see it differently. How will you find out what you like if you never try anything new? What I try or don't try is not up to you. Until the other night I was beginning to think of you as a friend. We walked in silence back to the park gates, parting with barely another word. I dreaded facing Dale. Jake would hardly have made up the story about Toby and him. Given the ease with which the Jays and Toby hopped into bed with anyone they fancied, to be jealous would be silly, but how could Dale have let me talk of Toby as my boyfriend, and have said nothing about what they were up to? That evening, when I got back to the flat, Dale was in the kitchen peeling vegetables. Can we talk? I asked. He turned to face me. What's wrong? You don't know. Toby. Toby and you. Okay, okay, you're right to be. I'm not going to lie to you. Let's go and sit in the lounge. It might help if we had a drink. 38. 
Copyright Alan Kesslian. He poured two large vodkas and we sat facing each other. So, I said, surprised by my own self-control, you've been seeing Toby. I have to admit it's true. I'm sorry. You must think I'm a total bastard. This is going to sound like a load of excuses, but what happened is, do you remember that first night when I saw you at the bar with him at the give and take? I hadn't slept with anyone for nearly a year, and had been building myself up to do something about it, and there he was, a terrific looking guy coming onto me. I grabbed the chance and, well, picked him up, or let him pick me up, whichever. I should have known better, he's not. I didn't contact him again, and when you told me you were keen on him, and you wanted him to be your boyfriend, I thought, well, good luck, hope things work out for you, I'll stay out of the way. Unfortunately, I'd given him my number that first night, and one day he rang me, saying he had to see me about something. I thought he must want to talk to me about how things were with you. He asked me not to tell you we were meeting. When we met he had nothing much to say, but he came on to me again. I can't really claim that he forced me into it. I should have said no, but... I was in the wrong. He was so hard to resist. Afterwards I felt guilty. Next time he rang I said no. The thing is he wouldn't let it go, he threatened to drop you, and to upset everything by telling you about his second time with me. So I agreed to see him again, and said nothing to you. He took a gulp from his glass, reached over to the one I was holding, and pushed it up to my lips to make me drink too. I should have stood up to him. Perhaps I didn't have the courage. The better part of me was hoping he would get tired of me, and then the problem would solve itself. My anger towards him had pretty well drained away. I said calmly, even so you should have told me. You lied to me and helped him make a bloody idiot out of me. How did you find out? Jake knew. He told me. Can you imagine what hearing it from him was like? I knew whatever I said it would sound like excuses. Toby's so attractive, he makes you feel. It was physical, nothing more. Please, Ben, don't hate me for it. The dishonesty is over now. Whatever you think of me, please believe I'd never intentionally do anything to hurt you. You know I think the world of you. How could I believe anything he said ever again? Having owned up and said he was sorry, he rubbed his hand up and down my thigh. Did he really think that would get him anywhere? He looked utterly miserable, the way he had the first time we met when I turned down sharing the flat with him. He had been in the wrong, but he had said he was sorry. What good would having a go at him do? What he needed was someone to comfort him. I did, too. 39. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 7. My circuitous route into Dale's arms had been like one of those yarns about a stranger in town who goes tramping down street after street, eventually to find the place he sought was round the corner a few yards from where he started. Having at last crossed into the territory of physical love, I felt that everything between us was right, exactly as it ought to be. From that first night together, it was to be the two of us against the world. The next day, just after one, he rang me at the bookshop. His voice was so soft and deep that it made me long to touch him. You all right? He asked. I'm in a daze. Jeremy's noticed. He saw me gazing out of the window, sneaked up and startled me by slamming one of the big encyclopedias shut behind my head. I'm as bad. In the staff restaurant, I went up to the counter but couldn't face eating anything. All I had was a cup of tea. You can't not eat? I'll recover. Later, Jeremy called me into the little office at the back of the shop to help him with some figure work, and I explained the cause of my dreamy abstraction. You, Dale, ah. I see. Good. Steady, dependable type. I'm pleased, hope it all works out for you. You must both come over for a meal at my place, Sunday after next if you're free. Actually, Ben, there is something I have to tell you, 
Another development with the business. Oh. Well, development might not be quite the right word, it's not going to affect you all that much. You know that empty shop a couple of doors down that used to be a funeral parlor? Well, someone I know has taken it. As a matter of fact, in a way, you are partly responsible. Remember those astrology books Dale's aunt had? I contacted an old friend who is fascinated by the paranormal, to see if she might be interested. She told me she had been thinking of setting up a little business, a psychic shop or something of that sort. When I mentioned the old funeral parlor, she decided to come and see it. She has wasted no time, she's taking possession next week. She'll be on her own at first, most of the time anyway, and she's hoping we will be able to cover for her if she has to slip out somewhere during shop hours. A psychic shop? Does that mean making appointments for people to have their fortunes told? No, not fortune telling, well, possibly, I'm not sure. More likely Alicia will sell things. Books, crystal balls, magic potions, I don't know, whatever nonsense that kind of shop sells. Sounds a bit eccentric. Now don't pull a face. It's a matter of business. If a customer came in here wanting a book about race horses or famous casinos, I would try to find it for him even though I think gambling is a waste of time, effort, and money. We may not think much of astrology and crystal ball gazing, but if others attach importance to it, who are we to sneer? Actually, Alicia is quite an expert in all things Egyptian. 40. Copyright Alan Kesslian. She's been engaged as a professional, been on archaeological digs in the desert sands, can translate the hieroglyphics. Anyway, wouldn't be a great problem to keep an eye on her shop for half an hour or so if she has to pop out, would it? Well, if she's a friend of yours obviously, but we are trying to build up the business here. She will reciprocate when she's settled in, I'm sure. Should make it possible for me to show you more of the book trade, take you along to some of the book auctions, that sort of thing. Oh, good. We mustn't be overcritical of paranormal fancies, he coaxed. Ask yourself how irrational and logical a lot of our own trade is. We make sales to collectors desperate to get their hands on books on arcane subjects of no importance or relevance to the world we live in. Think of the Victorian Good Housekeeping Guides. Aren't they merely curiosities from a bygone age? Are we entitled to sniff at the items a psychic shop sells? Alicia's a good sort. Outspoken, but a good sort. Whether she was a good sort or not, what would wags like smiles at the give and take say if they found out about me helping in a psychic shop? The appearance of a sign saying Hatshepsut's pavilion above the old funeral parlor's window warned me that Jeremy's friend Alicia was about to manifest herself. She was a woman in her forties with large brown eyes and shortish hair, fawn but tinted to a darker shade of brown in places, or it might have been the other way around. When Jeremy introduced us, she gripped my right hand firmly in both of hers for so long I wondered if she meant to keep it. I said, unusual name you've given your new shop. It's Egyptian. Everyone has heard of Cleopatra and Nefertiti. Well? Hatshepsut was the only female Egyptian pharaoh, from an earlier period, a highly successful woman, well regarded as a ruler, and she ought to be better known. Glad you asked. Has Jeremy mentioned the possibility of giving me a hand? He has mentioned minding the shop for five minutes if you have to pop out anywhere. Jeremy nodded. Well, that would be a help, but I've got boxes full of books on astrology and other occult subjects. Jeremy says you're an ace at organizing stock. Loads of stuff is being delivered over the next couple of days. Be a change for you from the worm-eaten old tomes Jeremy fills his shelves with. What do you say? Are you up for it? Jeremy showed no reaction on hearing his valuable rare books described as worm-eaten old tomes. Offended for him, I said defensively, Jeremy buys things that his business sense tells him are in demand. What do you mean, am I up for it? I've got a boyfriend. I was not referring to your sex life. 
Are you willing to give me a hand with my stock? Jeremy said, I did tell Alicia we would find space in the basement for her books while the shop fitters are in at Hatchup Suts. If you have time, she would appreciate it if you would go through what she has. Wanting to sound unenthusiastic without actually refusing, I said, no problem, though I'm not familiar with the subject area. Alicia's boxes of books were too heavy for me to manage on my own, and Jeremy was gasping for air after helping me maneuver one of them down to his basement. I got him a chair and took the rest of her books down by myself in manageable quantities. Most had come from a bookshop in Hayonwai that had closed, and luckily the owner had compiled a list in alphabetical order, everything from astrology to Zendavesta. They were a mix of second-hand books and new ones that had been published years ago and had not sold. Checking the market value on the internet and updating the prices, some of which were still in pounds, shillings, and pence, took me hours. The shop fitters needed only a week to install shelves and furnishings for the new psychic emporium. After they had left, Alicia invited us in to see how it was progressing. Wind chimes suspended above 41. Copyright Alan Kesslian. The door tinkled ethereally as we entered. Shelves and glass display cases had been positioned so as to create all sorts of nooks and crannies, good for encouraging people to linger and inspect the curiosities on sale, but the hidden corners increase the risk of pilfering. Have you thought of getting a closed circuit TV system, I asked, to discourage the kleptomaniacs? You're very cynical, she said. Don't you think people who are interested in the occult will be above that sort of thing? I'd have thought the opposite. You're not relying on extrasensory perception to find them out, are you? It was meant as a joke, but she said seriously, to be truthful with you, I'm not at all gifted myself. Not that I haven't tried, but, she shook her head. Oh dear. You've sensed something though, haven't you? Don't say there's a jinx, please. After all, the place used to be a funeral parlor. I did not know how to respond to this. She turned to Jeremy. He's not keeping anything from me, is he? Ben wasn't hinting at anything being wrong, Alicia. It's his sense of humor. You'll get used to him. Well, let's hope so. It would be really useful if he could keep shop for me when I go to my Egyptology meetings on Wednesday afternoons. What do you say, Ben? Jeremy asked. The hour helping out now and again had suddenly lengthened to half a day every week. Thinking quickly I reminded Jeremy he often went to a book fair on Wednesdays. He's right, Alicia. They're about once a month. Sorry, she said. I asked you round to see the shop, not to twist your arm. One or two of my friends might help out if I'm stuck. Let's leave it for now. How about a glass of wine and some nibbles, as a little thank you for your help so far? She had only two chairs so I cleared a space on the counter to sit on. Above my head hung a mobile with little ceramic tiles in the shapes of stars and planets. A shapeless black thing in one of the crates attracted Jeremy's eye. What have you got over there, Alicia, he asked. My Cleopatra headdress. She lifted out an Egyptian-style wig and positioned it on her head, the long black hair hanging down over her shoulders. What do you think? Jeremy and I laughed, and she said with mock annoyance, not meant to be funny. You might show a little respect, especially you, Jeremy. Ben is still young, he can be forgiven. Actually Jeremy himself had come in that day dressed rather like an overgrown schoolboy in a royal blue blazer with gold braiding, the pair of them made the place look like a fancy dress shop. At the center of Alicia's head dress was a cobra's head, possibly stuffed, but certainly dead. I gave in to the temptation to hold out one of her Garibaldi biscuits towards it, and asked, does it eat squashed flies? Patting the sides of the headdress she said, Isis, help me. Protect me from these heretics. On the way back to the bookshop Jeremy said, she's not so bad you know. Heart's in the right place. Half a day for a little while, Ben, to help her get started. We could take turns. 
Wonder what her Egyptology meetings are like. Probably people sitting around a table, pretending to sharpen razor blades by putting them under a plastic pyramid. You're wrong about that. She is recognized as an expert on the hieroglyphics of a certain period. It's not like you to be grumpy. No, it's not. Sorry. Maybe it's sorting out at all those books of hers in the basement. Soon have them finished, anyway. Working half a day a week in her psychic shop was a bit of an imposition, but not bad enough to risk Jeremy's good opinion. Anyway, Jeremy said, you know she's one of us. What, Alicia's a shirt lifter. You know perfectly well what I mean. She's a lesbian. Hatshepsut's pavilion opened six weeks before Christmas, a good kick-off time for any business selling 42. Copyright Alan Kesslian. What, to my mind, were trinkets and novelties. Alicia crammed the place with an amazing variety of stuff, porcelain phrenology heads, palmistry hands, peculiar-shaped candles, supposedly Egyptian artifacts, large sparkling crystals, a thousand oddities cluttered her shelves, the more expensive safely locked in a display case. The shop had bright sales areas under spotlights, and shadowy nooks where the intrepid might try on tribal face masks or handle totemic figurines. In one corner rubber vampire bats and big hairy spiders hung from imitation webs. The first time I went in for a stint of minding her shop it appeared to be deserted until, after a couple of minutes, the cobra's head became visible above an ornate screen. Ah, I sense a presence, she called out in a wavering voice from her hiding place, have you come from afar? I've come from Jeremy's bookshop. Oh it's you, Ben. In good time too. Lucky, I'll be able to do your horoscope before I go. I've just installed a new software package that's been highly recommended. Come and sit down. Afraid I'm just not into that sort of thing. Help me try it out. It won't take long. Fortune telling by computer instead of astrological charts, you must admit it has a funny side to it. I need the exact latitude and longitude of where you were born, and the date and the exact time. You're not serious. I was born in South End in the early hours. Isis preserve us, she said. Early hours? You might have had more consideration for your poor mother. How do you expect me to produce your horoscope if you can't give the map reference and exact time? I don't expect anything. Doing my horoscope was your idea. Forget it. I've spent hours trying to get to grips with this damn thing. You might try to be a bit more cooperative. Oh never mind, I'd better be on my way. She took off the Cleopatra headdress and placed it on one of the phrenology heads. You don't wear that to the Egyptology meetings, then. Heavens no. They're all much too serious. And passers-by in the street might think me a bit weird. You're not smirking at me, are you? As if I would. Don't think that's the last you've heard of the astrology system. I can understand you not sharing my fascination with the cusp of Venus, but you might try to show a modicum of interest in Uranus. One thing does come over very clearly, all the same. Someone you know will be front page news before the week is out. What was going on in her head for her to say someone I knew would be in the news? Surely she had broken a basic rule in the fortune telling game, never make a prediction definite enough for events to prove you wrong. I couldn't help blurting out it is highly unlikely that anyone I know will be front page news. Willing to bet on it? She harassed me into betting a fiver, grinding down my resistance with the argument that a refusal would imply I did not believe what I was saying myself. By the way, if any customers do come in you'll find that some of the stock still needs price tags. I've left a price list on the shelf under the till. Help yourself to tea or coffee, and you'll find plenty of biscuits. I'm hoping to be back at about half past four. If you do need to go out, put up the back in five minutes sign, lock the door and don't forget to take the key. It's in the till under the ten pound notes. You've got my mobile number. Left alone in the shop, I switched her computer on again, thinking of checking my emails. 
she had set up password protection, and on the off chance I typed in Cleopatra. The login screen disappeared and a message in large red letters scrolled across, Ben, if that's you trying to guess my password, try Nefertiti. She had clearly predicted, or anticipated, that I would try to use the machine after she left. Worried she might have set further traps for me, I gave up and tied price labels on some necklaces and amulets 43. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Instead to pass the time. Next I rang Dale to relieve the tedium, but could only leave a message as he was at a meeting. When he called back he pretended to be a sheik wanting to buy love potions to stimulate the sexual appetites of his wives. Hi Dale, I said. Alicia probably has some love potions in stock somewhere. You should see for yourself all the weird stuff she has. Much as I would like to drop in for five minutes, I've just come out of a meeting and a load of urgent stuff is waiting on my desk. Means I'll be late getting home again. The next day he came into the bookshop. The hospital owed him lots of time and he had taken a couple of hours off to see Hatshepsut's pavilion for himself. We hugged and kissed, and over tea and some of Jeremy's biscuits he showed me his newspaper. At the bottom right of the front page, under the heading Double Celebration for British Writer, was a paragraph that read Champagne Corks were already popping for Lloyd Larcher on publication of the omnibus edition of his novels, when the Buxel ER's Guild announced it was to receive its Lifetime Achievement Award. A Guild spokesman said nobody in contemporary fiction can touch him for range and variety. Oh no. What do you mean, oh no? Yesterday Alicia bet me five pounds that someone I knew would be front page news. She's must be cheating. She's been tipped off. How could she know he would be on the front page? Jeremy might have heard somehow and told her. However she learned that the story would be on page one, she had tricked me out of five pounds. When we went in to see her I showed her the paper and said, you win. You've caught me out somehow. Lloyd is someone I know, and the story about him did make the front page. Lloyd Larcher? Can't stand the man. How did he get himself onto page one? Let me see. She read the paragraph and said, Still, I've won our little bet, haven't I? Thank you, Isis, thank you, she said, clasping her hands together and gazing upwards, though the object that hung from the ceiling above her head was not Isis but a plastic vampire bat. Thought your predictions came from astrology, not from Isis. Anyway here's the five pounds. I wasn't thinking about that silly old coot larcher. This is what the bet was about. She pulled the current month's edition of the magazine Psychic News from its plastic wrapper. On the front page was a small photograph of Alicia herself under the heading, Egyptologist Opens New London Venture, and inside was a half-page article about Hatshepsut's pavilion. I don't want your bloody five pounds, she said, picking up the note and slapping it down in front of me. I was joking. Did you really think I was trying to rob you? What I would really like is someone to give me a hand with the astrology system? To my great surprise, Dale volunteered, I'll have a go, if you like, though frankly I think astrology is a lot of twaddle. He discovered how to change the settings so that the nearest large town or city could be entered instead of the map grid reference, and made the time of day that someone was born an optional entry. As an experiment we generated a horoscope for Lloyd Larcher, entering a date of birth that would make his present age 102. With a lot of trial and error we worked through until we generated a 10-page horoscope, including an impressive colored chart of stars and planets. It is a clever package, Dale said, ingenious. I'd better leave you to try it out and go back to work. Surely you want to see what the stars hold for you. Alicia suggested. He smiled wryly and put on his coat. Maybe another time. Well, let me give you something from the shop. Has anything caught your eye? How about one of these? She unlocked the display case and took out a turquoise glass pyramid, inside which could be seen another smaller, pyramid in glass of a lighter hue. Would this go nicely on your desk at work? It might go missing. You don't need to give me anything, really. 
44. Copyright Alan Kesslian. But I want to. Do take it, you'll find somewhere for it. As the weather cooled towards Christmas, Jeremy came into work wearing one of those winter coats with thick, padded horizontal bands of fabric like motorbike tires going all the way round. These insulating layers increased his girth, and on his way to the little back office he had to squeeze between shelves of children's books on one side and encyclopedias on the other. The fabric squeaked loudly as it rubbed against the spines. Thinking that if he became wedged in the gap I would have to climb over him to fetch the office scissors and cut him loose from his clothing, I suggested that he remove his outer covering before he entered the bottleneck. He went into a huff at first, but could not resist examining the spines of the books for signs of damage, and then said, I suppose I'll have to do as I'm told. He had been out of spirits the day before because Lloyd Larcher was hesitant about coming to his little Christmas party. The veteran author had another engagement, and doubted if it would be over in time. Dale and I, Alicia, her girlfriend Muriel, and a few of Jeremy's business contacts were expected, but Lloyd's presence would have made the event special. I cleared some space in the shop and put up folding chairs and a trestle table for snacks and bottles of wine before going home for an early dinner. When I returned with Dale, Jeremy had put on a big sweater with broad brown and yellow horizontal stripes. Judging he was in far too amiable a mood to take offense, Dale said, I know who you're meant to be, Jeremy, you're Mr. Bumble the Beetle from Oliver Twist. I expect any minute Ben is going to tell me I'm always bumbling around, Jeremy replied. About twelve people, in all, attended. Dale struck up a conversation with Alicia about alternative medicine, and soon we were exchanging opinions about acupuncture, hypnosis, herbal remedies, vitamin pills, and how to choose from the hundreds of different remedies and tonics available. We enjoyed a couple of hours chatting, eating, and drinking. Then Alicia asked me if, when I was left alone in the bookshop, I ever noticed anything odd, such as strange noises, tricks of the light, or peculiar smells. Oh no, not really, I said. Jeremy's customers aren't as decrepit as that. You know what I'm getting at. These shops have been here for more than a hundred years, had different owners, survived bombing during the Second World War. Traces of the past remain behind, some are visible like that old-fashioned bell on the shop door, but others cannot be detected so easily. Then Jeremy suggested she bring out an Ouija board she had recently acquired. He added, this is a traditional time of year for ghosts, so perhaps we should, by way of a little entertainment. Most of Jeremy's guests decided the time had come to leave, and I whispered to Dale that we might do the same, but he said, it's okay, let's indulge him, if we go hardly anyone will be left. Alicia, her girlfriend, Jeremy, Dale, and I were the only ones to stay on. We sat in a circle around the Ouija board, an ornate affair with the letters of the alphabet in Gothic script. We were all to place our fingers in grooves on a special hexagonal glass dish with a lighted candle in its center. Jeremy switched off the lights. The flickering candlelight made our faces appear mysterious, conspiratorial. At first the glass dish in the center remained immobile. We all waited. I turned my head and caught Dale's eye. He was smiling faintly, probably thinking how silly we all were. Then the glass dish began to glide slowly across the board. We audibly drew breath. Was one of us pushing it? It came to a halt above the letter M. We all pronounced M, our voices somehow achieving unison and harmony. Next the dish moved off to the letter A, and as we all said it it moved off to R, followed by L. A cold blast of air suddenly blew out the candle, and at the same moment we heard books thudding onto the floor. Jeremy turned the lights on again. Oh blast, he said, must have caught the bookshelf somehow when I reached out for my glass of wine. Sorry everyone. Help me put them back, would you Ben? Among the books I picked up was Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It had fallen open at the page in which 45. Copyright Alan Kesslian. The Phantom First Appears. Jeremy took it from me and read out the description of Marley's ghost. 
When I sat down again Alicia fixed me with a questioning gaze. Are you quite sure, Ben, that you have never noticed anything otherworldly when you have been on your own in the shop? Oh, come on Alicia, said Jeremy, don't overdo it. Let's have another try. See if the spirit world has a message for us. Dale put his hand over mine under the table. I can feel a freezing draft coming from somewhere. He said. Must be from the window at the back of the shop, can't have put the latch down properly, Jeremy answered. This was an improbable explanation, that window had not been opened since I had been working there. Once again we settled around the Ouija board in the flickering candle light. Again, after initial hesitation, the glass glided across the board, and we intoned the letters at which it stopped, M, A, R, L, E, Y Marley. Suddenly we heard a determined rapping at the shop door. Behind the blind, a dark figure was silhouetted by the glow of the street lights. The latch clicked. Who's there? cried Jeremy in alarm. The door opened wide and the temperature in the shop plummeted. A ghastly apparition, weighed down by chains, floated into the room. As it crossed the floor it left an eerie greenish-brown powdery trail behind it. I shrank back, afraid that some of this deathly deposit might rub off on me. Dale clasped my hand. I could not take my eyes from the specter. In the meager light of the candle I began to make out its features, which were, I began to realize, uncannily like those of Lloyd Larcher. The mouth opened, and it spoke in what was unmistakably his plummy voice, terribly sorry, Jeremy, may have dropped a bit of a clangor. He rattled his chains. Could have sworn you said this evening was to be fancy dress. Jeremy put on the lights. He, Alicia and Lloyd grinned widely, all three obviously in on the joke, their teeth shining like rows of tombstones on a moonlit night. They must, though, have been a little disappointed that more of Jeremy's guests had not stayed on for Lloyd's performance. Of course I had not really thought, in my rational mind, that a ghost had been conjured up by the Ouija board, but for a while my heart had been thumping all the same. 46. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 8. My help in Hatshepsut's pavilion soon amounted to much more than minding the shop occasionally while Alicia nipped out. She rang, or came into the bookshop, several times a day to ask about local advertising or wanting an opinion on potential new items of stock. Once she showed me a couple of parchment scrolls, one illuminated with Egyptian hieroglyphics, and the other with the early Germanic script known as runes. They cost about a pound each wholesale, and she thought they might sell for double that, a 100% profit. Deciding which of thousands of items on the market might be profitable, from aromatherapy candles to complex psychometric charts, must have been perplexing. As she always put up with my teasing about crystal ball gazing being akin to navel gazing, or that reading tea leaves could have no advantage over reading coffee grouts or the scum someone left behind in a bath, now that she had asked a sensible question I said, maybe the hieroglyphics are worth two pounds as they're so attractive and colorful, but the runes are, are not that striking, are they? They're basically a series of black lines that sometimes cross one another. Runes are supposed to be psychographic, she said, using a word that was obviously psychobabble. Still, you may be right. Perhaps I'll put them in at 150 and see how they do. Ah, she sighed, the sales rep was a very attractive and persuasive woman. When I told Jeremy about the parchments, he remembered an old black and white film, Night of Thetemon, in which the villain contrived to plant a runic script carrying a curse on his victims. At nightfall a monstrous fiend would appear and savage them. The only chance of salvation was to pass the runes on. Whoever held them as daylight faded would then become the fiend's prey. At home after work I found a runes parchment in my bag that Alicia must somehow have planted there. I showed them to Dale. Guess where these came from? Alicia? What are they? Runes. Here, I said, trying to pass them on to him. Prunes. No, I'm fine in that department at the moment, thanks all the same. I said runes, not prunes. 
They're an old Teutonic script. Did you ever see that film? Oh yes, ages ago on TV, it's coming back to me now. The villain passed them on to his victims, who would see them waft away on a sudden breeze, before being attacked by a monster. So you're trying to bring me to a horrible violent death are you? Only to save myself. I wouldn't inflict anything like that on you unless it was in a really good cause. That's your excuse, is it? Fine boyfriend you are. In the evening, we took the runes with us to the give and take. A terrific hunk stood at the bar wearing a denim shirt and a pair of low-cut jeans. As a little prank, Dale asked me for the runes, and casually meandered up to him. I followed. Pulling the parchment from his pocket, Dale said to me. What do you make of this? Any idea what it could be? Some of your fan mail. 47. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Ha ha. He caught the eye of the Adonis in denim and asked him. Have you ever seen anything like these? The guy smiled and took the scroll from him. After he made a few wild guesses, we explained about the old horror film and the curse of the runes. Smiles half heard what we were saying and came over. Well, that isn't like any sort of music I've ever seen. What makes you think they're a kind of music? You were talking about tunes. Not tunes, runes. Soon a little group of us at the bar were passing the runes to one another, slipping them down each other's shirt fronts, and pretending to be terrified of being left holding them when the bar closed. After a while the conversation moved on, and I forgot about them until, getting into bed, I saw the parchment sticking out from under my pillow. Dale? who had been watching me, said did you think you'd got away with trying to pass the curse on to me? And what you don't know is that actually I am the demon from the film, and I'm taking vengeance on you right now. He grabbed me, pushed me down and sat on my chest. It was not too difficult to topple him over sideways. We wrestled for a while, the bedding and the two of us sliding down to the floor, until we tired of the struggle, relaxed our grip on each other, caressed and made love. The following afternoon I went to serve in Hatshepsut's pavilion so that Alicia could go to her Egyptology meeting. I wonder, she said, taking off her Cleopatra headdress, what this would look like on you. Wonder all you like, it's not going to happen, especially now you've given the cobra's head those green glass eyes. Spoil sport. Where's your sense of fun? I spent hours renovating that wig. It was a moth-eaten old thing I found in a theatrical costumier's store. You have to admit it does make an impression on customers in the shop. You're right about that, I said, not saying what kind of impression I thought it made. Oh, nice of you to say so, Ben. Must admit I did wonder if the beady green eyes were going a bit too far. Well, see you later. I was trying to decide how to amuse myself during my solitary hours in her shop, when a friend from the give and take came in. Oh, hi Ben, got any of those runes? Well, yes, in that box over on your left. They gave us a good laugh last night, didn't they? 150 each, okay, he said, picking up three parchments. They were fantastic at breaking the ice with that new guy, you know the dream in denim. Starting up a conversation for the first time with someone you really fancy is always tough going. Everyone uses the same tacky old chat up lines. How many times have you heard I thought it was totally dead in here until you came in? The runes were a great opener. A couple of the other lads want to have a go, too. During the next few days a stream of customers for runes came in. Learning how well the parchments were selling, Jeremy put in an urgent order for some for the bookshop. He had not had them on display for long when, of all people, Toby appeared. Been a long time, he said. Don't worry, it's only your runes I'm after. How are you doing? They're one pound fifty. Everyone is larking around with them in the club. I'll take a couple. You're looking good. I took his money but said nothing. Not still pissed off with me, are you? Sometimes it's best to move on. I have. 
I handed him the runes. Watch out for the demon. Demon, what do you mean? 48. Copyright Alan Kesslian. I wanted to keep our conversation brief and said, Oh, nothing. If that's how you feel, he said tersely, and left. For a short while, in trendy pubs and clubs, going up to people and trying to pass runes onto them became a craze. I asked Alicia why, with so many parchments being passed around, no attacks by the fiend had been in the news. She countered by asking, did you think there would be? No, but, I suppose the whole thing started with runes being passed on to you by a sales rep. What this means is that one bit of the occult has been proved to be nonsense. You are still here, not assailed by the fiend, despite having dozens of runes parchments in your possession at nightfall, and none of your customers has been attacked either. But they're only fake runes. You don't think I would risk creating mayhem by selling genuine runes to anyone who happens to walk into the shop, do you? What? Have you got genuine runes in a box under the counter for special customers? Someone should report you to trading standards, selling fake runes. Don't be so mean. Actually, you and Dale might be interested in a new line that's coming in on Monday. Little polished pebbles in sets of six, each with a rune inscribed on it. According to the leaflet, you can tell people's fortunes by the order in which they come out of the bag. You can also slip them into someone's pocket to summon the demon, or throw them all up into the air and try to catch them. You could take a set, show them around, see if they catch on. Thanks for the offer, but maybe we have had enough runes for now. My view of the paranormal was as sceptical as ever, but Hatshepsut's pavilion had provided more entertainment and hilarity in the weeks since it opened than all my months of work in the bookshop. The next little adventure started with the sale of a tin of biscuits, Nefertiti's Nubian assortment. Each nibble was in its own paper wrapper, and had a message on the inside saying that the omens for love were very strong, or that good fortune lay ahead, or giving some other groundless prediction. A smartly dressed woman who grinned all the time approached the till carrying one of the tins, evidently wanting to impress with her constant display of teeth. She must have been very fond of snacks, for I saw a few crumbs from an earlier treat on the lapel of her coat. When she had gone I noticed some flyers for Alicia's so-called personal astrology service on the shelf under the counter. At the bottom of the page were the words Ask Alicia or Ben for your personal consultation. She had included my name without asking me. I tackled her about the leaflets when she returned from her meeting. I thought you'd be pleased, she said. A male customer might be happier to talk to another man, especially if he is hoping for the more personal subjects to be included. He might tell you a few juicy bits about himself. I'm not interested in some weirdo's juicy bits. People will think I'm setting myself up as a fortune teller. If anyone at the give and take sees one of these I'll be a laughing stock. You're so difficult sometimes. She sighed and put on her Cleopatra headdress, now even more ridiculous as she had replaced the green-eyed cobra's head with a grotesque plastic spider. My irritation evaporated as I suppressed the urge to laugh. She said, I put your name in as an acknowledgement of all the help you're giving me in the shop. Actually, since you've raised the subject, I do sometimes sense that you might be gifted. Now don't pull a face. I always envy the gifted. I'm not myself, you see except that I think maybe I'm good at spotting those who are. Alicia, please tell me you won't invite people to contact me to arrange horoscopes, fortune-telling, or anything else of that kind. All right, if you must be so fussy. At least your boyfriend doesn't have a closed mind. He's agreed to come in on Thursday to help me add some new material to the reports on the astrology system. 49. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Dale did not believe in the stars any more than I did. He had probably agreed to help because he found it hard to say no. I went back to the bookshop to see if any orders had come in via the internet. Half an hour later she burst in, clearly overwrought. She was still wearing the Cleopatra headdress, the eyes of the plastic tarantula now glowing intermittently, 
presumably battery powered. Ben, you haven't sold any of the crystal scarab beetles lately, have you? They were probably the most expensive items not to be locked away in a glass case. No. The rune parchments were still going well, but nobody bought scarab beetles. Three or four of them are missing. My only sale, other than the runes, was one tin of Nefertiti's Nubian assortment. The last time I checked the beetles was a week ago. My fault. We can't watch everyone a hundred percent of the time. It would be easy for anyone to slip a couple into a bag or their pocket. Unable to think of any comforting words, I offered to make her a cup of tea. Thanks, but I'd better go back and open up again. Jeremy's gone out, but I could come round a bit later when he's back, maybe in half an hour. When I went round she was sitting behind the screen at the back, looking for Lorne. I sat opposite her. You could put the scarab beetles in the lockable display case. Yes, but it's what the theft says about people in general. You begin to lose faith. Not everyone is trying to steal, are they? We'll just have to keep an eye out for anything suspicious. In a shop you have to accept some losses. She said, you did once suggest putting in security cameras, didn't you? Things have not got as bad as that yet. Let's talk about something else. You're good with words, aren't you? Ever thought about ghost writing? Don't you have to be dead first? Very funny. You're determined never to take anything I say seriously. I take shoplifting seriously. You see the funny side of some of this stuff yourself sometimes. Well, some of it, plastic vampire bats and spiders are just for amusement, people mainly buy them to give to their kids. The fascination, though, is in trying to get some insight into the unknown, or unexplained. There is uncertainty all around us. Even with ancient Egypt, despite all the artifacts and records we have, that world is mysterious to us. For instance, we don't know why the pyramids at Giza were built to the particular size that they are, or why they are in the configuration of the stars in Orion's belt, or why pyramid building was abandoned for underground tombs. All the unknowns in our world are worrying in one sense, but they also give us hope. In order to help with Alicia's astrology system, Dale took off a few more of the hours that the hospital owed him. Her idea was to add some optional paragraphs to the standard reports for people who were trying to lose weight. This extra guidance was to slot in with all the usual guff about Jupiter coming into your birth house and Mercury going into retrograde. He had been with her for nearly an hour when she rang to ask me to go over. Dale had found, in the software package, a way of doing what she wanted, but having adapted a couple of sentences from a booklet on dieting, they were stuck for ideas. All they had put in was, planetary alignments may make comfort foods particularly tempting, but remember, efforts to lose weight can so easily be undone. Be firm of purpose. The second was, your ruling planet is in your birth sign. This may help with concerns about weight. You may find a gradual reduction in calorie intake over a longer period more successful than a short drastic diet. People write whole books about dieting. I thought this would be easy, Alicia moaned. Most of the hospital's booklet is too clinical, too medical. The wording is wrong for a horoscope. You're never lost for words. Any ideas? Well, let me see. How about, cut down on sugary drinks while Saturn is in Uranus? 50. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Is that dietary advice, or lewdness? Bit of both. How about, the influence of the moon makes this a good month for round continental cheeses, or you could say, as Taurus is your star sign avoid beef sausages, and for Pisces, shellfish may help stimulate new interests. Oh for heaven's sake, why can't you be serious, she said. That was just a bit of mental limbering up. I thought it might help free up our creative side. Dale calls it brainstorming. As we were talking, I noticed that the woman who had bought a tin of Nefertiti's Nubian assortment from me a few days before had come in again, and was browsing the stock intently. 
she decided on another tin of biscuits and walked over to the till. Alicia got up to serve her. Something, maybe the woman's stance, maybe her forced grin, or the memory of the crumbs on her coat, made me suspicious. I ran across, and insisting on making sure the contents were complete, grabbed the tin and removed the lid. The inner transparent wrapper had been opened, two of the biscuits were missing, and in their place were four scarab beetles. Alicia's face became fierce with hurt and anger. The spider's eyes of her headdress glowed intensely red. She took the scarab beetles from the box and held them out on her palm in front of the now terrified customer. Well, we could make this a matter for the police. Otherwise, these four crystal scarabs will cost you 25 pounds each, on top of the price of the biscuits. Will you be paying in cash or by credit card? Her tone would have frightened off the runes demon. The woman paid by credit card, her hands shaking, and hurried from the shop. Alicia turned to me. See, I told you, she said. Surely, I thought, she was not about to say she had suspected the woman of stealing all along. Told me what? You know very well. Exactly what made you go and open the biscuit tin. Oh, I'm not sure, there was something about the woman, the way she... You knew, didn't you, you just knew. I was right. You are gifted, she said, wagging her finger at me. I shook my head. Dale came over and stood beside me, smiling mischievously. You must admit she has a point. You definitely are gifted, he said, touching me in a very private place, the shop's counter preventing Alicia from seeing what he was doing. Perhaps the most curious line Alicia decided to stock was biothaumaturgical hats. She came bustling into the bookshop one day, her face flushed under the Cleopatra headdress, the spider's eyes red but not glowing. Tell me what you think of these hats, she asked. In the brochure of the Natural Clairvoyance Company she showed me pictures of three wide-brimmed hats decorated with plants. Attractive female models tilted their heads coquettishly under luxurious flowers and leaves. The blurb claimed amazing benefits. One hat was said to have magical herbs to bring healing qualities, another to have a selection of meadow flowers that would help the wearer regain contact with nature, and the third was a miracle of germination special that would awaken psychic powers or boost fertility. Alicia obviously wanted me to say they were wonderful. To avoid her question I said, I'm afraid, Alicia, they wouldn't suit me at all. Isis give me patience. It's all right for you. You know that you're gifted. You may deny it, but you don't fool me. Try to imagine how I feel, being in the business but completely bereft of any sort of psychic ability. Anyway, let's not get into that. What I'm asking you is, do you think the hats would be a good line for the shop? This notion that I was in some unspecified way gifted, based on me twigging who had stolen her scarab beetles, was an embarrassment. She had begun whispering to customers in Hatshepsut's pavilion, that's Ben, by the way, he's gifted, you know. She ignored my denials because, she insisted, my actions had given me away. She said she understood my reluctance to talk about my powers, because 51. Copyright Alan Kesslian Psychics tend to be distracted a lot of the time, a weakness easily exploited by the unscrupulous. Thinking this to be another of her harmless fancies, I did not make a fuss about it. Only a few days earlier she had given Dale and me necklaces with a long central bead enameled in rainbow colors, a discreet and attractive way of letting people know we were gay. Now she smiled at me, hoping for an encouraging comment about the Natural Clairvoyance Company's biothaumaturgical hats. You could order one of each, they should look impressive in the window at least. Why not? See if they sell. She smiled. Do you really think I should, Ben? You're not just saying so. Yes. You'll try them on as well, won't you, to see if they suit you? Obviously pleased to be told what she wanted to hear, she said, now you're in a sensible mood, please give a bit more thought to the ghost writing, I've asked you about it before. 
Now don't just dismiss it offhand like you did last time. Tell me you'll think about it. I smiled but did not answer, hoping that shortly some other notion would displace the subject from her mind. Later that day I met Dale in the give and take and mentioned to him that Alicia had spoken of ghost writing again, thinking she wanted me to attempt spiritual contact with someone like Oscar Wilde. He said, you're confusing ghost writing with spirit writing. What? People who think the spirit of Charles Dickens is using them as a human agent to write a new novel. That's spirit writing. Or you sometimes hear of automatic writing, though I'm not sure exactly what that's supposed to be. Ghost writing is where a book, usually an autobiography, comes out in a celebrity's name, but it was really been written by someone else who isn't mentioned. Is it? Of course, now you've said that, yes, you're right, how stupid of me. Could turn out to be interesting. Maybe she wants you to write her family history. I'm not sure if I want to get to know her as well as all that. Soon after this, Toby appeared at the bar, the first time I had seen him since he came into the bookshop to buy runes. He must have spotted us, but avoided looking our way. Smiles stayed at the other end of the bar, deliberately making him wait. A few minutes later two strangers came in, clearly there to meet Toby. Smiles beamed at us to get our attention, stuck his tongue out and moved his index finger from side to side under his chin in a throat-cutting gesture, then relented and went to serve them. The group did not stay long, perhaps ten minutes, and after they left Smiles picked something up from the floor near where they had been standing. He brought it over to us. Your ex said he was just back from Amsterdam. He dropped this. It's a packet of cannabis seeds. He left them on our table, and we carried on talking. When we left, for no real reason, I took them with me. When the biothaumaturgical hats, decorated with artificial flowers and leaves, arrived, Alicia cleared everything else out of her shop window. Displayed on porcelain phrenology heads they were certainly eye-catching. According to the instruction sheet from the Natural Clairvoyance Company, for them to be fully effective the imitation herbage supplied had to be replaced with living plants. She asked me to help set up the Miracle of Germination model, which came with a tubular propagation unit that fitted all the way around the wide brim, rather like a miniature rainwater gutter with a transparent plastic cover. The special growing medium was ready sown with inspirational seeds, including wood anemone to attract spirits of the forest with their psychic powers, enchanter's nightshade to help with spells and charms, and red clover to improve fertility. Toby's cannabis seeds were still in my pocket, and when she was distracted briefly by a phone call I opened the envelope and dropped several into the compost. She turned her head suddenly and almost saw me. To engage her mind on something else I suggested we plant the other two hats with mustard and cress so that, should the psychic benefits prove elusive, at least we would have something green to put in our sandwiches. 52. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Why can't you ever be serious? Well, I seriously mind the shop while you go off to Egyptology meetings. Yes. But then you always make silly remarks if I mention ghost writing, and now you're doing the same about the hats, even though you said earlier that they were worth getting. Okay, what was it you had in mind about ghost writing? I'll be serious. Are you really going to listen at long last? This concerns someone very famous, very much in the public eye. Everything to do with him has to be treated with secrecy. I am not sure if I should even tell you his name. If you want me to listen you'll have to tell me what this is all about. What kind of person are we talking about, a politician, a TV personality? Promise me you won't let this go any further? All right, he's a rock and roll star, one of the biggest, Rick Schwager of the Rocking Boulders. A long time ago when he was going through a particularly difficult time, he came to me for advice. We are still in touch, a couple of times a year at least. Could it really be that Alicia, who was about to remove her Cleopatra headdress and put on a newly planted miracle of germination biothaumaturgical hat, was in contact with such a world-renowned star of rock and roll? 
You're telling me you know Rick Schwager. SHH. Keep your voice down. Years ago he needed guidance on dealing with a sect claiming to be a revival of an old Egyptian religion. The Oracles of Aten, they called themselves. In the 1960s strange hippie cults were springing up everywhere. You probably remember seeing some copies of a book called Oracles of Aten among the stock you took down to Jeremy's basement. Their leader was hoping to lure Schwager's group in the same way as that bogus Maharishi got his hooks into the Beatles. They claimed their beliefs harked back to the period when Nefertiti's husband, the pharaoh Akhenaten, turned away from the religion of Isis and the other traditional gods, and set up a new capital city for himself in the Nile Delta. The modern sect lasted only a year or so. Rick Schwager has been trying to find someone to help him write his autobiography for years. Part of the problem is, he blows hot and cold about it. Everything would depend on whether he took to you or not. Are you interested enough for me to mention your name? Simply to meet Rick Schwager would be fantastic, maybe the most significant event in my whole life. Putting cannabis seeds into the brim of Alicia's new hat now seemed a very silly thing to have done. What if she found out, and the prank made her think me too unreliable? Still, I could hardly go digging around in the brim in the hope of finding them again. And they would probably not come up. 53. Copyright Alan Kesslian. 9. The three copies of the book Oracles of Aten, currently stored in Jeremy's basement, were proof that Alicia's story about the sect was not entirely fanciful, however imaginative her general interest in the occult might be. Could she, for instance, really believe in astrology? Dale asked her once why, since the constellations and planets were clearly visible in the night sky, no one had successfully predicted the winning numbers of the national lottery from them. Her answer was that the stars might be useful for forecasting general trends or bringing out people's inner natures, but they might not be suitable for pinpointing specific items of data. Did she, though, really believe that something that did not work with straightforward questions would be effective with highly complex ones? Yet, after the dodgy sect had been wound up, her twice-a-year contact with Rick Schwager might have been only very brief phone calls or emails. Even if he still wanted help, it might only be with checking dates and sorting out old papers, not actual ghost writing, for which other people, Lloyd Larcher for instance, were likely to be much better suited. Not that I would be sniffy about even routine work for such a famous rock and roll celebrity. She emailed him about updating his horoscope, adding that if he still wanted help with his autobiography, she knew someone who might be suitable. Inevitably she mentioned that I was gifted. A reply came the next day, commissioning the horoscope update, and asking for more information about me. Within a week I received an email asking for a short meeting. I was collected from Fool Rose Court by car a few evenings later, having left work early, showered, and put on my coolest clothes. Bang on time the doorbell rang. I opened it to find a middle-aged man with a shaven head who said, Hello, you Ben? All ready to go. I followed him down to a limousine. He opened a rear door for me, said everyone called him the handyman, and invited me to help myself to drinks from the little bar fitted behind the front seats. Worried that alcohol, combined with anxiety, might dull my brain when I saw the man himself, I chose a small bottle of orange juice. The handyman must have been watching in the mirror, for he said, you're not a boozer, then. I do drink alcohol. It's a bit early. Excuse me for asking, but are you working? Alicia said you helped out in her shop sometimes. Yes. But I work mostly in the bookshop a few doors along. Bookshop? Sounds okay. Last one we tried for Rick's book was full of crap. Turned out to be a journalist wanting to dig up smut on the lads caused us no amount of trouble. Had to teach him a lesson. Worried, I said, I hope we're not starting off with the idea that I'll need to be taught a lesson. Don't take it like that. If you're straight with me, I'll see you're okay. You have to understand people are trying it on with the lads all the time. My job is to keep shit stirrers away. 
if you're genuine you've got nothing to worry about. What do you sell in the bookshop? Porn. No, it isn't bloody porn. We sell antiquarian books. Got you going, have I? I'd better not call it a second-hand bookshop, then. Look, I've got nothing 54. Copyright Alan Kesslian. Against you. For all I know you're a diamond. Relax, forget I said anything. Sit back and have your drink. I'll put some music on. I could see very little through the car's tinted windows, and he would not tell me where we were headed on account of security. The opening guitar riff of the Rocking Boulder's early song Striped Candy came through the speakers behind me, followed by the voice of the young sounding Schwagger, Striped Candy, it's a part of the scene. Striped Candy, I lick it real clean. Striped Candy, makes me feel randy. Striped Candy, you know what I mean. Half an hour later we turned off the road into a short drive. We left the car and walked to the entrance of a large villa, the front door ornamented by Art Nouveau glass panels. The handyman ushered me up to a first floor parlor, where I saw waiting for me the The Rocking Boulders lead guitarist, Heath Yards. He was on his own, sitting on a long sofa, blowing his nose loudly and at length. I don't know, you're supposed to have come off everything, but you're still doing a lot of snorting, the handyman said disrespectfully. Very funny, handyman, Heath said, not appearing to mind the jibe. So, he asked, nodding in my direction, this him, the one with the sixth sense? Least he don't look too much of a freak. This remark came from a man whose wizened face was even more lined and haggard than in recent press photographs, and whose hair sprouted from his customary headscarf like the bristles of a severely battered paintbrush. You've got about an hour, said the handyman, leaving us together. I sat down and refused Heath's offer of a drink. Next he offered a smoke, and when I turned that down he lit up a cigarette for himself. Then he asked if I wanted to try some of his prescribed medication, all the stuff, he said, his menders would let him have these days, although one of his tabs could, he promised, give me a bit of a buzz. Thanks, but I'm fine, really. Suit yourself. What do you want to do then? Go through some of our old photographs. Yes, that would be great. He pulled out one of perhaps a dozen enormous photograph albums. Sit beside me over here so I can show you. With the album spread across our laps, he turned page after page of pictures from the 1960s, the faces of the adolescent group appearing astonishingly innocent. Some were of the band on stage, some showed them relaxing indoors, but the most striking were outdoor shots. They had a rawness to them. Wow, I said plenty to choose from here for an autobiography. When will Rick be joining us? Sorry mate, he's still in St. Tropez. He's left a voicemail for you though. Heath handed me a phone. I was awed to hear one of the music world's most famous voices speak to me personally. Came down here on a quick trip but have got a bit sucked in so, you know, thought I'd leave you a quick message to say, you know, basically, got to be quick. Thing is, me and Teef go far back, way far back, so he should be able to clear up any queries you've got. Hope to have a quick word with you some other time. Quick bye for now. I handed the phone back to Heath and said, it sounded like he called you Teef. He calls me that, on account of me having buck teeth when I was a kid. He pointed to his incisors, as though I might not know where his buck teeth had been. He added, I sometimes call him quick. 